Can you all hear me? Yes, great. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the last event of uh, the Elastic Project. Uh, we have a, a hybrid event this morning, so we have people in the room and people online. So um, just for the, the people that are online, um, you'll have the ability to ask questions during the event. We'll take those questions at, at the very end. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the um, Metropolitan City of Florence for hosting us in this amazing place this morning. Um, I'm sure we'll have a, a, great, a great event. So just to start, um, <clears throat> I'd like to um, uh, we'll have the, the, uh, the program here on, on, on screen. Um, we'll try to, um, to stay to the, uh, the, the time allocated so that we have enough uh, uh, discussions and, and questions at the, at the end. So uh, if, I, um, if I ask you to, uh, to stay on time, then uh, please bear with me. Um, just to start, we'll, uh, the, the, the welcoming notes will be given by uh, Eduardo Quinones from Barcelona Supercomputing. And um, I wish uh, everybody a, a great event. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for attending this uh, meeting, those that are here and those that are online. Um, so I'm going to provide a quick overview of what is the project Elastic. So the first thing, let's just provide very generic information about a project. So Elastic is a European project, and Elastic stands for a software architecture for stream scale big data analytics in fog computing ecosystems. It is a project that started three years ago. In fact, the project finishes today. Today is the last day of a project. And it is composed by uh, eight partners. So what is the project about? So the project is about how we can extract knowledge valuable knowledge from the data, from the massive amount of data that is generated from a city. So if we have this picture, there is not much we can say about it. We can see a person that is housing. But if from this data we apply a set of data analytics, for example, to detect the people, to track them, to extract the semantic information, and so understand that there is a car that is approaching, that there is a pedestrian that is crossing. And more important, if we fuse this information with other sources, like semaphores, we can then understand that this is a dangerous situation. And this information is very valuable. It's knowledge that then the city can use to inform a car, that there is a pedestrian crossing. A fundamental element is that this information needs to be pro provided in real time. This means that the end-to-end -end response time of these analytics needs to be uh, provided in a given time value. If we provide this information 10 seconds, 5 seconds after it happens, this information is useless. Okay, But if we provide this in less than half a second, maybe we can use this information to be transmitted to the relevant actors. Moreover, this information is also very valuable, not only for real time, but also for storing this information and, for example, understanding how many times people is crossing in red. And this is a very valuable information that, that can be used to implement better mobility policies. And just to show you that I'm not lying, there is the guy that was crossing while uh, the, the traffic light was uh, red. But of course, the challenge is not analyzing this data, because in fact, there are very good data analytics methods that can do this. The challenge is being able to manage all the data, all the mass massive data that a city is generating every day, every minute, every second, because we don't have a single camera. We have many 
cameras. We have also information coming from other uh, public transportation. We have information coming from, from other sensors. And so here the question is, first, how we facilitate the people to develop their analytics so they can really extract the knowledge that is needed from all these data or, or all these data sources. And also, how we can map them to the computing resources available in a city. Because at the end, we need the computing resource, the communication resource, in order to implement this type of analytics. So this is exactly what is the project about. The project is about how to deal with all this complexity. How we can deal with the massive data sources that can be processed in an, in an heterogeneous computing environment composed of edge resources, IoT resources, cloud resources, and how we can transmit all this data through an heterogeneous network infrastructure. And this is exactly what is the project about. How we can address all this complexity. And these are the key objective of the projects. How we can address this complexity to first facilitate the development of these complex data analytics workflows independently of the underlying platform. And this is a key to allow the programmers to develop their functionalities so they, they can extract this knowledge I was talking before. If we provide access in an easy way to this, what we call the compute continuum, this this infrastructure composed of IoT, edge cloud resources, this will facilitate, this, this will open a new opportunity of implementing data analytics at different levels. So we can implement analytics at the edge, real time is provided, or we can provide analytics on the cloud in which we have highly computational capabilities. And something that is very important for the Elastic project, <laughs> that is all this needs to be fulfilled, all this needs to fulfill the requirements imposed by the domain, real-time requirements, energy efficient requirements, privacy, security, et cetera, et cetera. What we have done in a project in order to address this? We have implemented what we call a software architecture gathering a set of technologies that makes this possible. Those technologies independently were not able to provide these features. But by gluing them together, we have been able to provide these functionalities. And how we have, and, and in order to prove it, to, 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 to prove um, that this, uh, that the capabilities of the software architecture, we have implemented this in, in three smart mobility use cases, addressing the challenges towards autonomous vehicles, providing developing analytics in order to provide smarter and safety mobility, and also enhancing uh, the maintenance services of a tramway. And that's all from my side. I really hope that you enjoy this uh, event. And now I think it's time uh, for the use cases to uh, present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edu. Um, I didn't present myself, I realize, so I'm, um, I'll be your moderator this morning. And uh, so my name is Marc-Elian Bégin. I'm, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Six Squared, one of the partners in, in the project. So after this, uh, this great intro, um, our first session is going to be Intelligent Tools for Smart Transportation. So I'd like to welcome on, on stage Gianluca Mondo and uh, Vincenzo Di Massa from uh, Thales Italia, as well as uh, Jürgen Asfalk and uh, Claudio uh, Ravaglia, uh, so, yeah, from, from Jest, and of course Jorgen is our host 
Where's our host from the metropolitan city of Florence? Are you? <laughs> okay, that's great. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. <laughs> so please uh, take a seat and I give you the mic. Okay. This is the... Okay, good morning. Um, <clears throat> I'm Gianluca Mandò, Innovation and Technology Manager in uh, Thales Italy. Uh, Thales Italy in this project has an important role in managing and coordinating all the activities relevant to the use cases, uh, work package one. Uh, in particular, in uh, the role of Thales uh, here was uh, uh, to implement important steps, uh, important pillar of our strategy in the autonomous tram solution. Uh, in fact, it was the opportunity. Okay. It was the opportunity for us to develop two important systems that are the basis of the autonomous tram. The first one is the uh, positioning solution, what we call NGAP, Next Generation Autonomous Positioning. Uh, it is the system that allows the tram to understand, to be aware of uh, what is the position along the tramway line, independently from any system that is installed along the line on the ground. So our ambition here was to be uh, really autonomous in calculating the position of the tram, and uh, the real ch the, 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 the challenge behind uh, is starting from Elastic to certify this solution at the maximum uh, integrity level for railway. So it will be at the end uh, this product, a uh, silver product, uh, because this will allow us to remove uh, re um, safety elements on the ground, tri tram detectors, because the tram itself will calculate its position and will detect its position along the line and will send it to the signaling uh, system. Okay, our NGAP uh, is based on several, is collecting data from several sensors, in particular uh, radar, uh, NIMU, inertial measurement unit, and uh, GNSS uh, satellite uh, system. Then we have uh, designed a specific data fusion, sensor fusion algorithm that is able to uh, collect all this data and uh, to fuse them to calculate the position and the speed in a, in a reliable way uh, for the tram. Uh, so these are our sensors, just to, to, to give you a concrete uh, view of our system. Uh, the, that is uh, the, the continental radar. We have an inertial measurement unit and uh, in, in the lower part of the slide and a GPS Genesis receiver in the middle. So we use the commercial uh, sensors coming from the automotive market and we integrated it uh, for a different application, the tramway application. So these are the performance that we achieved. Uh, you can see here we, that we are able to uh, achieve an accuracy in position below one meter. We are around 60 centimeters, really, all along the line. Uh, there are other uh, technical uh, parameters that you can see here in the table, but uh, uh, <clears throat> Are, are, are re really relevant for calculating the integrity and the reliability of the system. In particular, the protection le level is uh, an element that will allow us to achieve the maximum level of certification in terms of railway certification. Then we are able to calculate the speed accuracy. You can see below one kilometer per hour. Uh, I repeat, all uh, without using any uh, element installed along, uh, along the line. These are the trams that we have equipped with our solution. Three trams are running in Florence, uh, equipped with Thales sensor, Thales sensor fusion algorithm with a high performance computing on board, on the edge, because the tram in the, in the elastic architecture is on the edge. Uh, we need the real time for calculating the position. So uh, the algorithm is running real time on board on the edge, but is also providing this information, the outputs for other application in the cloud. So 
completely leveraging on the uh, elastic uh, architecture. You can see here other uh, picture representing the installation. We performed several uh, installations with uh, engineering vehicle also, uh, the vehicle in the middle, not only before arriving to install the, the, the sensor in the tram. Uh, you can see in the middle of the tram, uh, quite in, well industrialized, uh, the, the LiDAR and the radar. Uh, so what? I, I could consider a, a quite final industrialization uh, of, of the solution in terms of uh, this integration in the design of the vehicle. Uh, we, we developed uh, a, a tool also for evaluating our performances. As an example, we have uh, uh, designed and implemented and gap diagnostic and simulation tool. So we collected the data from the tram in real time uh, uh, we send the data in our premises uh, in Florence and uh, we can uh, run the algorithm in our premises to, for calculating the performance and for evaluating uh, the, the results. You can see here, in fact, in the next slide, the video. I hope it's running, yes. Uh, this is the, the, the HMI of our tool that you, we use for development, for engineering activities. The video is synchronized with the data coming from the sensor in the lower part of, this, of the slide. In the small yellow uh, circle, you can see the tram moving uh, along the line. Uh, just a quick uh, explanation. Uh, on, on the right part of, this, of the slide, you can see the speed calculated by the GPS, very reliable. GPS is reliable for speed. And uh, uh, by the radar, our radar. Uh, you can see uh, on the left uh, the, uh, the three uh, ac uh, accelerations calculated by the IMU. And, uh, uh, you can see you can see the some uh, uh, strange uh, behavior in, in 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 when you face a turn a curve. Uh, this is important for us for evaluating the performance of the sensor and of the, of the algorithm and the solution overall. Uh, the two uh, last uh, picture here in the lower part are the picture that uh, can allow us to, to arrive to the certification because. Uh, in the blue line, you see the error that, that the algorithm is uh, achieving, uh, comparing the output of the algorithm with the ground truth. And if this blue line remain between the red lines, you can be sure that you can uh, 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 you are integral and you can achieve a high level of reliability uh, up to. SIL-4 SIL for railway is the maximum level of secure safety. Uh, and we evaluate the performance with this diagram, usually uh, <coughs> used in the avionics, uh, that is the Stanford diagram. Uh, the important thing to be certified is that the arrow stay within uh, the white triangle. If you stay over there, uh, you can achieve the level of certification that, uh, that you need for railway to be autonomous in the future without any driver. Now well, I leave the floor to my colleague, Vincenzo Di Massa. Yes, there is some other slide uh, relevant to uh, giving you the, how our uh, solution is calculating, how well calculating the, the speed of, of the tram. Okay, now, Vincenzo, we speak uh, to you to, about the advanced driver assistance system, collision avoidance system, also called in our solution. Uh, okay, I give the floor to Vincenzo. Thank you, Gianluca. Thank you, everybody. And uh, so I will talk to you about uh, this um, obstacle uh, detection system and uh, uh, driver assistance system. Um, this part has been implemented in the Elastic project. Okay. This part has been implemented in the Elastic project with the purpose of providing data to the city uh, about what the trams uh, while driving see in front of them. How do we perform uh, this uh, detection? Basically, we installed some sensors on the 
on the tram itself and we transform trams into moving uh, computers uh, uh, on which uh, several alg algorithms are running. Um, here you can see a very raw architectural, um, very raw architectural diagram oops, of the system. <laughs> no problem. Very raw architectural diagram of the system, and um, basically it's a pipeline from um, left to right. So sensor data arrives, objects are detected, then uh, from different sensors and different object detections, the uh, information is glued together, is merged, or uh, as we say. Um, is fused, so we perform a sensor fusion uh, technique, uh, and at the end, uh, after fusing and filtering the data, we get uh, uh, the detections and we decide what to do if we have to warn the driver, because the system is an autonomous driving system, 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 so if to, we have to uh, warn the driver or not. So, we are using sensors, like uh, in the previous uh, um, presentation from Gianluca, I will show you quickly that we are using a radar, a LiDAR, and cameras. This is, of course, not uh, uh, nothing special about this. A LiDAR, basically, if somebody doesn't know, it's uh, a, a sensor that emits blades of uh, um, laser light that scan and um, sense the distance of what is in front of the sensor uh, uh, rotating. So we have these rotating blades that detect the distance of objects. And radar and camera are sensors that everybody knows about. So uh, in order to take the data from sensors and detect objects, we need object detectors and we need uh, some technology and then we need some technology for uh, the sensor fusion part. So what are we using? We are using, of course, neural network for the cameras. We are using uh, um, Kalman filtering, so optimal filter tiering for the sensor fusion. And we are using uh, a lot of uh, um, important uh, algorithms that allows us to reach the performance level that are needed for uh, what we will do in our roadmap in the future to certify this system as well to be a component of our autonomous uh, roadmap. Now, uh, now is the, the interesting part of the presentation, the uh, demo of the system through a video. So here you see uh, the system that we have implemented to uh, understand what is going on inside of the sensor and inside of the algorithm. This uh, system basically is showing you a recorded uh, run of the tram through the city. On the top left, you can see the picture from the camera. On the right, you can see the output of the 3D space uh, sensor detection and sensor raw data. So what you have here is the uh, LiDAR data, is the uh, lines that represent uh, the objects uh, in the scene. You have the blue boxes, that is the result of the object detector on the LiDAR data. Then you have small blue dots, I don't know if they are clearly visible in there, but there are many on the top left corner of the sheen. Uh, these are the radar raw data. So, uh, and you have uh, other dots here, like this yellow dot, that are uh, the output of our sensor fusion algorithm. So the part that fuses radar and LiDAR together. We are not using camera here because it would be too much information. And we are not filtering out in this representation the noise. Because in he, the noise here, so all these lines that are not objects, uh, help uh, the human uh, people to understand what is uh, uh, the correspondence between this picture on the right and the picture on the left. So I will start uh, the video. Please focus when the tram stops in a few seconds on what is happening on the left behind the poles. There are some uh, um, infrastructure poles and there is a woman there. In that part, you will see clearly why we are using different sensors. Because at the beginning, the radar will have low accuracy. You will see a dot from the radar very far away from the woman that is crossing the street. And uh, um, the LiDAR will, will help the, the detection. Then, uh, the other, uh, in the other way around, uh, the, the, thing, the situation changes because uh, um, the LiDAR will have difficulties to distinguish between the, the woman that is continued walking and the pole, but the LiDAR doesn't have this problem in, in that part. So you will see that the two, um, that the two sensors are re actually helping each other. So I start the video. It's, 
it's no sorry I start the video okay so the tram stops and on the left you will see the woman you see the woman is approaching is the dot that is the red dot that is uh, happening there now you have the lidar detection before was not lidar detection just the radar was detecting the woman now the woman will go close to this pole and the his blob, his blue blob, will be fused with the, by mistake of the sensor uh, with the pole, but the system is still tracking the woman. Now on the right, you will see a bicycle. Uh, a bicycle will, ap will appear here on the right, and the two sensors will cooperate even in this case, because at the beginning, both of them will see the object, but when the uh, bicycle um, drives far away from the system, uh, the LiDAR will, here is the bicycle, the LiDAR will stop seeing the bicycle. But still we are tracking because the radar is uh, continuing until we reach the limit of our system that is at this moment is fixed to 40 meters for uh, uh, demo purposes. So this is the, the an another part that is interesting about this, um, this presentation and is the crossing of several people. Here uh, we see that uh, the system is uh, um, capable of uh, tracking the people that is crossing and is tracking the people even after they go out of the camera view. There, there, there is a couple that has just went out of the view on the, on the right side. A few seconds more and we will reach another station where we will see many people crossing in front of the, in front of the train. And we will see that the system is capable of tracking individual objects uh, even when they overlap with each other, when they walk in different directions. And uh, uh, we, we are still, you see, there, are, there is many people uh, walking and we track them quite accurately. Uh, even if sometimes one of the sensors has, have trouble because uh, due to occlusions uh, and these kind of problems, not, it's not always well. Uh, possible to see the sensor measure out. So, what is the final result? This is the final result. So, when people is walking in front of the tram, this is what the driver can see. So, a lot of work to just make beep, okay, for the driver. But uh, what is important for the Elastic project is that the data that is behind the scene running is f flu um, flowing inside of the Elastic system and uh, take part into the decisions uh, that uh, all the Elastic project is doing about the uh, city, uh, smart city, I would say, uh, infrastructure. So I give my colleague. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I'm Elisabetta Furlan. I speak on behalf of Jurgen from the metropolitan city of Florence, and I will present to you the second use case. Uh, okay, I guess we have to skip a little bit. Skip, skip, skip. Uh, um, okay, I thought they were just put all in queue. And here we go. So this is the use case that we are presenting. Um, as uh, Eduardo was saying in the introduction, uh, we studied uh, uh, the interaction among different transportation modes, in particular public and private transportation modes, in uh, the view of a smart city framework, uh, trying to base ourselves on the fog architecture provided by Elastic. So why is interaction so important to us? Well, in an urban context, we have many, many times a situation like this. So we focused in, part in particular on uh, the tramway, the T1 line. And there are many places where the tramway is going to cross also car traffic, other vehicles traffic, in intersections where we will also have pedestrians on the road. And all these kind of interactions on the one side might pose a hazard. There might be someone skipping a red light, just passing through both a car and a pedestrian. And on the other also gives issues about uh, optimization of the traffic, both for the private and the public transportation. So what I mean by 
performance or optimization is a situation like this. We know that typically public transportation is given priority. So if there is an intersection and a tram is coming, the red light is going to come up for the cars, so they stop and the tram can just pass by. But there might be bad situations, say, where the first tram comes and then there is another one approaching the intersection. So the cars won't get a red light straight away. They will have to wait for a gap time where no tram is actually crossing the road, but they're just waiting for the next one to come. And then traffic might be piling up. So it is important to monitor these kind of situations, make sure they don't happen too often, and if they do, try to prevent them, slow down the trams, make them stop a little bit longer at the stop, so that if they need to occupy the intersection at the same time, they really need to be there at the same time, and we don't slow down also the private traffic. Another very important issue coming from uh, these interactions regards safety. So there might be some flow in the design of the intersection where, for example, the visibility is pretty low. Here there's a, a tree on the way and uh, someone might not see the tram coming. So in principle, they will have at least uh, an orange traffic light, but they might say, okay, I'm gonna make it. And then sometimes they don't. So of course, this is going to pose a risk and is also going to affect the performance of the transportation system. And we want to avoid a situation like this. So we want here to have some kind of device uh, in place that is going to give uh, some uh, feedback to the driver and tell him that uh, there is a danger coming ahead. And the same thing also for the pedestrians crossing. It happens very often there is a red light and the pedestrian just goes anyway. And here it is important both for uh, the driver to know that this situation is coming up, as we just saw earlier, but also to understand why this kind of behaviors come up. So we want to collect the data, store them, and then al analyze them to find some patterns and understand if, I don't know, maybe the pedestrians just want to run to the bus, but there is no uh, green light for them, so they just decide to cross anyway, or if they think, okay, no car is going to come anyway because there is the tram coming, and so yeah, I'll just go. So this was the general setup, the idea of what we were aiming at. Now I'm going to show a little bit uh, uh, how we put it in practice. So once we had in a clear vision of what we wanted to get, we had to study how we could really implement it. So go to the place and see how we could put uh, uh, all the devices to get up the data, how to optimize uh, their distribution so that we didn't have too many of them, but still we could collect a significant amount of information. And we came up with uh, this sort of the, uh, design where we had a few different components. Uh, we have monitoring components, so we have, for example, cameras that are telling us what the pedestrians, the cars, the trams are going to do. We also have a monitoring system for the traffic lights, which tell us uh, when it's red, when it's green. We also collect data from the tramway, and then there is a part of edge computing which is going to process all these data that are collected locally, and uh, if uh, there is any risk uh, arising from the situation, then there is an actuator which is going to transmit uh, some kind of warning uh, advice uh, to very specific devices which are put on board of the car. So this is the part which is performed at the edge. And then there is a part that goes into the cloud. So there is a system of connections among all the devices local, and then from the devices to the central cloud where then the batch analysis is going to be performed. So just to be a little bit more specific, first there was a study of a situation like this. So on the top you see the intersection we wanted to study and we could decide to put the cameras, say like uh, on the left or the right. Of course you need to decide the position, the angle, how tall they need to be, how many you need to have. And this is the final realization on the bottom. So you want them to capture as many elements as possible. And uh, these are the three places along the tramway where the cameras were put together with all the other monitoring, recording and transmitting devices. And then there is a fiber optic connection among all the sites and then to the central cloud to transmit the data. 
And uh, of course, uh, infrastructure was already present. There were already traffic lights. So we had to put in place some ideas for how to monitor the status of the traffic light without uh, impacting their security, say their certificate. So we had to uh, devise or use some non-invasive non monitoring system just able to record and transmit a change in the traffic light status. So to know when the red is coming, when the green is coming and so on and so forth. So this was one of the components, and then other components were installed, so the cameras, then there is uh, on the bottom there the unit that is going to do the processing, and then we have a roadside unit up there, the antenna thing, which is going to transmit the signal if needed to the uh, sensor uh, on board of the car or the tram to say, okay, there is a danger coming up. And now we have some results. Uh, okay, so this video, we are going to have Ali explaining it from uh, the Barcelona Supercomputing. Uh, so thank you, Elisabetta. I'm Meli Karchakli from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And uh, in BSC, we're responsible of implementing the data analytics and fusing together the different sources of information which were the cameras and the traffic light manager provided by the city of Florence, and also integrating information coming from the tram. So in this specific example, we will see that we have some information coming from the NGAP uh, uh, module of the tram, uh, receiving the, the position in real time. So in this video, we will see uh, the result of the analytics applied in one of the cameras that we had available in Resistenza. So in this video, we monitor this intersection and uh, we have defined some semantic areas that are the areas of interest in order to detect some specific events. So in this example, we, ha we will focus on, uh, on I okay. let's see if we can do it again. We will focus on three different types of events. The first one is cars crossing the part of the intersection, which is this square part here, uh, when uh, the traffic light is red or the tram is approaching. The second type of event that we will see is pedestrian crossing at uh, the track part. So all this part of the tracks is an area that pedestrians shouldn't step on. So whenever a pedestrian is detected crossing this part, we generate an alert. And the third type of event is the fact of pedestrians crossing within the zebra crossings, but when the traffic light status is red. So uh, you will see that uh, when these specific events are captured, uh, the boxes of the detected um, pedestrians or vehicle turn into red and we generate an alert. So this alert is eventually transmitted through the vehicle to everything infrastructure to the connected cars. And also this information is then transmitted to the cloud for further offline processing. So let's see the video. So you see, for example, that this truck was turned to red, the pedestrian is crossing uh, uh, where he shouldn't uh, cross, and now at some point the traffic light has turned red, so this also generated an alert. So that's all for my part. Thank you. So this is how it's done in practice, uh, and just to go back and reconnect it to the scheme I was showing earlier, as Ellie said, data are going to be collected there, they're going to be processed. If there is this uh, need to issue a warning sign, there is a roadside unit which is going to send the signal. On board of the cars or the tram, there is uh, this onboard unit, there is a receiver, which is going then to give us some kind of warning. So for example, if there is the risk of a queue forming ahead, or if there are these pedestrians which just cross by, then we are going to get the different kind of signals here. And this was uh, the part uh, concerning uh, uh, safety security in uh, the real-time analysis. Now we have a second video which is going to introduce us to the concept of dashboards, which are the tools that we use for monitoring and for trying to understand the patterns, as, as I was telling you earlier. So Cesar is going to explain us a little bit. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Cesar Marin uh, from Information Catalyst. Um, can we go to the video, please? And there we go. 
Okay, this is a, an example of, uh, of the um, different presentation of the data once everything arrives uh, at the data center. Once everything is collected from the different um, uh, trams and, and tram stops. So we see um, we have uh, the potential to, to uh, generate uh, graphs, for example, uh, plotting the transition of traffic lights and see how they uh, um, align together with uh, um, the size of queues right in front of each traffic light during the day or during a period uh, chosen by, by the user or visualize the distribution of the, the queue size uh, for each traffic light. Yeah, and this information can be used by, by traffic engineers to determine um, um, points during the day where they could do something to the infrastructure to better, uh, to improve uh, the flow of people. Yeah, uh, part of the alerts generated that we saw in the, in the earlier video uh, show when people are crossing when they shouldn't. Yeah, so we can plot this information here together with uh, other vehicles Around, around the same time, around, around that area, and identify moments when um, uh, we, have, we have dangerous situations. The same information can be also plotted using maps, yeah, when we can indicate, uh, for example, queue sizes or, um, or, or uh, different vehicles uh, in, in, that, in that area. So the, the beauty of this is that uh, as a user, you, can, you have all that information coming from the infrastructure and you can plot it in many, many possible ways. And um, we have this uh, um, uh, separated in different dashboards, one per uh, intersection as, as chosen for the project. Thank you. Thanks. So, so just to give you some uh, examples of the dashboards that we can analyze, we might have something like this, which is pretty useful for traffic engineers. This one is going to correlate the length of the queues on top with the status of the traffic lights. Of course, it's not just, okay, it's red, you have a, a queue forming, but there might be different kind of interactions. It might be that the red light is coming, but other traffic lights around that are going to give you the green. So the cars are coming and then they're getting stuck at the next traffic light. And all of these uh, can help us in optimizing the synchronization of the traffic lights. So this is one. And the other for uh, the safety aspects, uh, again, going back to the problem of pedestrians crossing where they're not supposed to. Well, it might be exactly because the tram is coming or it's leaving, so we have many people around and they just want to go home or want to hop on the tram, and then they're going to cross the road. Collecting data in this uh, sense might then help us to devise a better timing also for the pedestrian crossing uh, signs. So with this, I came to the end, and what we can say is that we studied uh, how our issues can be addressed uh, using the uh, fog technology, the fog architecture of the elastic uh, setup, uh, both to address this safety and these optimization issues uh, in real time and uh, in remote analysis. And we found these tools very powerful in addressing uh, these problems and these questions and also paving the way for uh, uh, more developments uh, in this collaborative uh, uh, and coordinated automat automated uh, uh, vehicles. So uh, I think now we can just switch to the next presentation. Okay, next presentation, please. I'm Claudio Avaglia from Jest, and I'm presenting the maintenance, uh, predictive maintenance use case. We focus on uh, the trackware detection, and uh, we install it on our maintenance vehicle that is now on uh, Unita. And uh, we have installed several cameras, one in the front for a panoramic video, and one under the maintenance vehicle to have uh, a visual prospect of what the mirroring box, uh, there is a laser scanner, is, uh, is getting the information. On the inside, we have a central unit that is basically a PC with uh, that uh, do the data from the acquisition. With uh, there is also a tablet unit and a Wi-Fi unit, and uh, there is also an NGAP equipment from uh, from the other from the other. 
The, this is an example of a data acquisition. This is the laser blade that you can see that is uh, scanning the rail in uh, search of, uh, of any issue. The, the acquisition has been done every two weeks on uh, the first line. We have uh, done uh, more, more, acquire, more acquisition on the depot area because it's simpler, because the maintenance vehicle can only go out uh, on, uh, on night. So we can do some, uh, acqu uh, some, um, we can do some uh, training on, uh, on the depot area. We have uh, installed uh, on the, on the depot area, we installed the uh, full Wi-Fi coverage to automatize the, the data acquisition. When the maintenance vehicle come back from uh, from the truck, they can send uh, to the Just Cloud via SFTP all uh, all the data that have been uh, acquired. And uh, this is the Just Cloud, and this is where the the VM are stored from the, all the Elastic partners, and all the data are stored from uh, from the acquisition from uh, from Just. And that's full from uh, for me. I believe to Cesar that we will present a video. Thank you. And we are moving to another video, um, which is about uh, what we do once once that uh, information coming from the laser reading, uh, what we do with that, with that data. So we built uh, Information Catalyst built, built this uh, this software we call Predator, where we get all these readings and uh, we let the user choose uh, a date, a date in that uh, um, for which they they would like to to, to see what's what's going on. Um, they first they see this information on a map, and they can they can pinpoint um, the different readings they got on a map and uh, see all all places where. The where is within normal uh, and safety and safe um, limits, or whether the the, um, the readings are actually uh, that they will need attention of the of the engineers. Uh, the tool also shows um, the um, the trend of that of those readings, whether there has been any any recent change or whether there hasn't been any any much uh, not much change there. But also, uh, uh, what is of interest here is. Uh, the tool is capable of predict uh, future uh, wear of the rail track and uh, indicate uh, for each side of the of the track whether there's been any change in the shape that would require uh, engineers to go to that location and and have an inspection and obviously that that um, by doing that uh, we are helping we are, we are helping them to um, schedule to schedule maintenance, which is far less costly than doing this in, in case of emergencies. Um, and, um, well, with the beauty of Google Maps, um, we, if the user wants to, we can also use the, the, the satellite view, which uh, in many cases is, is far better than just, just seeing, a, just seeing this in a, in a, in a, um, uh, with a drawing. Uh, but in essence, yes, this is the, this is what we do with that uh, data coming from the from the laser. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to apologize. There's a slight discrepancy between the online program and the um, the schedule that we're, we're running this morning. Don't 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 disappear. We have a few minutes. Um, so we have about ten minutes for 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 questions. So anybody has a has a question. I have plenty. <laughs> so, yes, yes, please, in the back. So the question is, when there's a um, an object detected in in red, right? Does does this apply only to humans, or it could also apply to apply to animals or objects? Who wants to take this? Uh, this question. <laughs> Come back on stage. <laughs> uh, okay, so I will um, also in the next presentation we will see a bit more in detail how we perform the detection. 
but uh, uh, what we do is that we use uh, um, an open source uh, DNN, a deep neural network, to detect the object. So in our case, we use uh, the YOLO uh, algorithm, and we use a specific training set that was done for urban environments. So I think that uh, the training set contains cars, trucks, uh, pedestrians, uh, motorbikes, and uh, bicycles, and uh, a, a few types of objects. Um, uh, like that. So there is no specific uh, detection for other type of uh, creatures, animals, etc. And also sometimes uh, the detection of pedestrians or motorbike riders and cyclists is not very precise. Now, uh, Elastic did not focus on optimizing this detection process because we just wanted to show the capability of the Elastic software architecture to implement this type of analytics in real time. But if we wanted to optimize this process, we would do a more uh, accurate training of the deep neural network to take into account the specific type of objects that we would like to, to track. So. Thank you for the question and the, the answer. Um, it's fascinating, right, to, to, to see so many use cases uh, coming together after at the end of this, this project. Um, very impressive. Yes, another question. Can you repeat the question? So, okay, so the question is, so what, what is the impact on, on weather condition on the, on the algorithms? Caesar. Well, in particular for the, um, the predictive maintenance that we have, we have the data coming from, from the, the, um, the laser, uh, the, um, the rail tracks, they are way too dirty. And, uh, there, there's rubbish there, there's grass, there's rain, there's, there's water, there's, it's, it's, in the end, the result is, it's the, the input data, it's, it's very, very noisy. Yeah, so we had to apply uh, uh, some filters to the original data, uh, clean to remove certain uh, um, um, to remove areas that were not of our interest. Yeah, and also also clean um, the in particular, the, if you can imagine the, the shape of the of the rail going like that. Yeah, just just on this side on these curves, that's the, the interest area that, that we were focusing on. Uh, so those were the areas that uh, we, 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 we cleaned the most uh, during, during the analysis. Um, the rest, well, we just ignore because it's just way, way too, too noisy. Does that answer the question? Can you complete this? Yeah, um, I don't know if the question applies also to the tram, but let's answer also for the tram part. So um, in Thales, we um, we are really worried about this uh, part, how the sensors uh, deal with different weather conditions. And, uh, and at the moment, we, we didn't uh, um, do measurements uh, with different weather conditions in the field. What we did, we implemented the simulator. We modeled how the different weather conditions uh, can impact uh, the can, can impact the, func the functionality of the system. And so we are running synthetic experiment with different weather conditions. The next step will be to implement uh, a, a real testing campaign with uh, real weather condition tests. So, since you, you covered the two use cases, I will cover the third one. And I will only say that uh, we will discuss this further in the last presentation about uh, the non-functional requirements of the system. Because in the use case of the city of Florence, what can affect is the high temperature, for example, that may make some of the edge uh, nodes uh, vulnerable due to the high temperature. So we will see how the system is able to reconfigure itself at, up, up to some point and uh, reallocate the resources based on the current conditions. So this will come, at, uh, this is a spoiler for what is next to come. Thank you. I think, I think every sensor strategy is challenged differently from different weather conditions. And this is why I think the fusing strategy that, that you, you described earlier is, is, is really interesting because it probably 
you know, increases the chance of finding gaps in the different weather conditions. So fusing things probably improves the probability of, of being able to remain sightful. Um, we have time for perhaps a, a last question. Sure, sure, for, forget it. So let, let's tackle the, the so one question on, on latency, right? So what, what is the latency, the time it takes to round trips? So, you know, is, is that something that we're concerned with? I think so. Um, do you want to? Yeah, for the onboard decision uh, um, about uh, whether there is uh, an obstacle in front of the tram or not, we are, uh, um, I mean, it's a, a soft, uh, um, soft real time decision at the moment, and this decision is about 50, 100 milliseconds uh, for, for, for the alarm to happen. Instead, for the positioning solution, we calculate the position of the tram each 10 milliseconds. So the output of the algorithm is every 10 milliseconds. I suspect for the laser one, the, the real timeness was less of an issue because you do you do trend analysis and so on. So yeah, okay. For, for object detection, did you? For object detection, as you saw in the demonstration video, uh, we managed to process in real time around three frames per second, three to four frames per second. But this is more than enough to 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 timely detect uh, this type of events that we monitor. For example, we see the we track the pedestrian crossing the, the zebra with uh, uh, a satisfactory resolution. Uh, what we observed was sometimes we had some delays from uh, the other sensors that were integrated. For example, sometimes the traffic light manager system reported the change of status of the traffic light with some delay. So in our case, we couldn't do anything. We simply um, probably lose some events, but uh, usually the delay was a couple of seconds. So in the end, we caught up and uh, maybe we could capture a pedestrian crossing with red from the first moment, but uh, until the, the crossing was finalized, it was detected. So these things can be refined by specifically attacking the, the parts of the pipeline that introduce this sort of delays. And for the um, other analytics, the uh, predictive maintenance and uh, also for the, the, um, uh, the dashboard for the metropolitan city, um, because these analytics are offline and historical, uh, well, there, there's no there's no um, urgency here in terms of uh, having uh, this as soon as possible. Um, so measurement was not was not done. For example, for the uh, predictive maintenance, uh, the vehicle, as, as was said earlier, uh, the vehicle goes at night. Yeah, they travel along the line, they get the measurements, uh, they do some work there during the line, uh, and once it comes back. Uh, data is passed to the, to the rest of the system, it's being processed, but this is at night, nobody, nobody goes into the system and check what's, what's the result. But the following day, when they come back to the office, the result is there. So I think another observation we can make is the fact that with latency, latency impacts differently different use cases we have, right? The same way as, you know, whether it will impact different sensors, so it's, it's a, it's a, there's a Cartesian product here based on the type of sensors, the type of use case we have uh, that the system needs to to uh, to come. So that's a very heterogeneous, and it's part of the challenge of putting these types of, of systems together. Do we have time for a very quick last one? Pick, pick one. Can somebody detect somebody? Can the system falling on a track? So, can the system detect somebody falling on a track? That would be great if we could, right? Eh? <laughs> yes, of course, because um, thanks to the sensor fusion, probably 
I imagine we, we don't have a, a recording of a real person falling on the trap. We can try, but anyways, we can simulate. Okay? But um, we have three different sensors, and probably the radar will be a little bit in trouble in detecting the, the, the fall down person. But uh, of course, it will detect the person when it's still standing up. And the LiDAR will detect very well the person if there is a person on the track. And uh, also the camera will, uh, uh, will perform. So fusing all the information from the three sensors, we have a quite robust way of detecting uh, objects. And uh, this is connected also to a previous question. Um, even for objects that are not uh, um, known by neural networks, because you know neural networks need a training set uh, with labels, and labels are a finite set of, ob of classes of objects. Um, so even in cases when where we don't see the object with the camera, we have radar and camera. So we have a detection with three sensors. And our camera are used in a, serious, in a stereo setup um, way. So when there is an object, we can sense the object, the presence of the object, even if we don't know the class of the object, also with the stereo cameras. Well, I can briefly comment on the part of the analytics implementing at uh, the city level. So there, the capability of the system is to detect and track the different objects with uh, the, uh, the different weaknesses that are introduced by detection in the tracking module. So we can capture a multitude, a multitude of events if we provide the semantic annotation and, and coding for that. So in our case, we didn't implement a specific use case of a pedestrian remaining on the tracks for a long time. But if the pedestrian is on the track, we will get the alert of the pedestrian being where, he, where they shouldn't be. Um, but then we can also correlate uh, other outputs of the tracker, for example, on the distance of objects, of vehicles and pedestrians moving. So we can have more advanced analytics, for example, when a car is stopped in a specific place, it doesn't move, this can be a different sort of event. Or if a pedestrian is stopped in the middle of the track for a long time, this can also have, have a different impact than the pedestrian just crossing. So these are depend on the use case, uh, owner what kind of events they want to, to implement. And also having those raw recordings could also be a, a source of further training, right, for annotation and so on. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. That was a great session, so thank you. Hope online and in the room you're, you're happy with this. I find it fascinating. Ellie, don't go away, you're, you're the next one. <laughs> so, yeah, no, you can't. So now, now uh, let's, let's try to open the, the lid and say, how, how do we do this, right? So. Let's let's uh, let's hear from a, a top-down approach um, what what it looks like. Thank you. Thanks, Map. So hi again. Uh, now um, we have seen how the three uh, elastic use cases were implemented in the context of uh, smart mobility. So now let's go a bit deeper into detail uh, and talk about how we introduced a novel software architecture that was capable of. Uh, uh, developing, distributing, and efficiently executing all the necessary uh, analytic workflows in order to implement these use cases. So, as uh, Edu presented uh, in the beginning of this session, we have uh, uh, introduced a software architecture that aims to um, achieve a vision with four specific technical objectives. The first one is to facilitate the deployment and development of complex data analytics that can run over a highly heterogeneous infrastructure. Then we want to enhance the performance by distributing these complex analytics across the compute continuum. And when we say compute continuum, we mean the whole pool of computing resources that are interconnected and span from the edge to the cloud. Then we want to fulfill the non-functional properties that come from the application domain. So we want to take into account different properties. For example, in Elastic, we will consider four different properties for time, energy, communication, and security that may affect the distribution and execution of these uh, analytic tasks across this uh, continuum. And finally, we want to exploit the high capabilities of the different edge platforms which support hardware acceleration and are energy efficient in order to do these analytics and improve the performance and achieve real-time uh, results. So with these technical object, object, uh, objectives in mind, we have introduced a novel software architecture uh, that consists of four key modules. 
The first module is called uh, Distributed Data Analytics Platform, or DDAP, and is resp responsible for the distribution of data and ensuring that it is made available wherever needed, either by the data analytics or by the end user, for example, to visualize the output of uh, results. The second component is our advanced orchestration that is uh, responsible of deploying the analytics workflow across the compute continuum and scheduling and, uh, monitor and uh, handling its execution. The third component is a non-functional analysis and with this, we mean that we implemented a distributed uh, monitoring tool, which is capable of monitoring in real time the status of uh, all the computing resources across the compute continuum, and as well monitor the execution of the application. So we will see later that there is a, a tight coupling between the output of this monitoring tool and the scheduler. And finally, we have the FOC-based platforms that include and integrate a lot of software components to provide the capabilities that are needed to implement these complex workflows. So we will see in detail that uh, we have uh, cloud-based container as a service, we have advanced edge platforms, and we also provide all the, uh, the different functionalities for telemetry, routing, etc. So we will go into more detail for each of these components uh, in continuation. Now, we introduced the software architecture. So how, we can, how can we leverage the software architecture to implement complex data analytics workflows as the one needed for the project use cases? So this is, here we can see the value chain, how we leverage this infrastructure. So first of all, we, we have to develop the analytics and handle the data, uh, the data distribution across the compute continuum. The second step would be to deploy the data analytics across the available infrastructure, and then we continue with the execution and, and scheduling of the different analytics tasks. Now, at this point, there is an interaction with the um, monitoring, uh, distributed monitoring tool. So, as the monitoring tool uh, follows the status of uh, all the computing and communication components across the system, it may lead us to the conclusion that we need to reconfigure the system to adapt to some change that has occurred in the compute continuum. So we have a closed loop between the, the reporting of the monitoring tool and the reconfiguration, the reallocation of computing and communication resources and the rescheduling of the application. So this closed loop is the, uh, provides the elasticity that is needed in order to achieve the performance required uh, by the use cases. So having seen the, the, the main idea behind the software architecture, let's, step, let's take a step back and see the different workflow analytics that were developed in the project. So without, without going into too much detail, this is the, the, the big picture of the data analytics methods that were developed. So they can be um, organized in three different blocks. The first one are the, the data modules that were developed for the tram. So these are, have already presented for the NGAP and ADAS use case and the predictive maintenance. The second block of analytics refer to the, the, the city infrastructure use case, the city of Florence. And the third one is the, the final uh, vi uh, visualization of data that is handled by the distributed uh, analytics platform. So in the remaining of this presentation, I will focus mainly on the analytics workflow that were developed and deployed for the city of Florence. So before we saw a, a demonstration of a, a video showing how the detection of the object and events was uh, taking place. So now we can go into more detail and see the specific me uh, methods that were implemented and uh, resulted in this video. So this example here are, the, are a snapshot of the two cameras that are installed in the resistance intersection. So the first thing that, uh, um, that we do is perform object detection. So as I mentioned before, we use a standard uh, object detection modules as the YOLO in order to detect the different types of objects. So for here, for example, we have uh, detected a car and a pedestrian. Then we perform object tracking. And by tracking, we mean that we follow the objects detected in consecutive frames. And this is very important because then we can have information on the trajectory of the objects and also information about their speed and position, uh, both uh, the relevant position in the photo, but also uh, we translate it to accurate GPS position of the users, okay, accurate with some 
minor uh, error. So after tracking, we apply the duplication if needed. So, and by the duplication, we mean that if we have two cameras that are partially overlapping, as the, these uh, purple areas drawn in this uh, example, we need to merge the information on the detected and tracked object and remove any duplicates. Then we aggregate all this data, and then the DDAP, uh, the distributed data analytics platform, is responsible of transferring this data whenever needed. So we leverage this information in two ways. The first one is to perform uh, hazard detection. So we do a semantic annotation. So in this example, we define uh, two areas of interest. The one is uh, the, the square area, which is the tram crossing, the intersection between the tram line and the street. And the second is the pedestrian crossing. And we can uh, detect different events. For example, a car crossing from this intersection or a pedestrian crossing for the zebra, for example. And then if we fuse together with additional sources of information, such as the traffic light status, we can derive alerts, uh, specific events that are hazardous. For example, the pedestrian crossing the, the, with red or the, where the tram is near. So this type of events generate alerts that are eventually transmitted uh, to the connected cars. On the other hand, we also leverage this information to transfer it to the cloud and do some offline processing that can lead to better policies and useful conclusions that can be used by the city of Florence, for example. So these are the two paths of the information. Now, okay, uh, this is, um, this is the, uh, the application pipeline and it can be implemented in a, I mean, we can do it processing one frame after the other in a sequential way. However, this becomes more complex if you think about that all these analytic functions are executed on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. So if you have a live video stream, we have to do all these functionalities for every received frame. And if we have multiple cameras, then repeat for the multiple camera frames. So in the end, the amount of analytics that need to be executed rises um, exponentially. So this is where the Elastic Software Architecture comes into play because it facilitates the development of analytics and their deployment and distribution in, in an efficient way and in an easy way for the programmer. So let's see a specific example taking into con consideration the instantiation of this software architecture on the use cases that we consider in Elastic. So in Elastic, as we, see, as we saw before, we had some cloud infrastructure provided that by one of the use case providers, Jest. And we have three edge clusters deployed around three selected intersections between the tram and, uh, and the public street. So we have three clusters, one in Batoni, in Arcipressi, and in Resistenza. And, it, and in each one of the three clusters, we have uh, three distributed edge nodes located in different cabinets. So this is our infrastructure. In addition to that, we have distributed data sources. We have the connected tram, as we saw before. We have the city infrastructure that consists of the cameras and the information from the traffic light managing system. And we also have the, the maintenance vehicle used for the predictive maintenance case. So the, all these data sources generate information that is then processed by, the, by this uh, software, software architecture deployed in the available infrastructure. So what are the basic functionalities that we need to take care of? First, we need to develop the analytics. And for that, we will see that we leverage an open source programming framework uh, provided by BSE that it's called COMS. So we first develop the analytics and then we deploy the different analytics across the compute continuum. And for that, we have integrated COMS with the Nuvla uh, service, which facilitates uh, a lot of the deployment um, across the compute continuum. Then we handle the execution and scheduling of the different analytics tasks based on some scheduling policies. And the outcome of this analytics generates data that need to be distributed as needed. So we have the offline analysis through the cloud and we have the real-time analytics that generate the alerts to be transmitted to the cars or the tram. At the same time, we have the real-time monitoring. So we monitor all the available resources and this can lead to the rescheduling of, uh, of, uh, the dif of, of the allocation of the different tasks across the compute continuum. So this is the big picture and the, the capabilities offered by the Elastic Software Architecture. Now, having said that, 
uh, we will go into more detail to the different components of the software architecture. So in the rest of my presentation, I will focus on the workflow scheduler that, uh, and, and discuss these three different functionalities. The development of the analytics, their deployment across the compute continuum, and their uh, scheduling, their execution and scheduling. So let's go back to, to the example of um, a processed video we saw before. So we have here uh, a snapshot of the processed frame. And uh, let's, we have a simple example of the different analytics modules that are implemented. So here we consider only object detection, uh, tracking, and uh, the detection of some events. So how would we develop such sort of uh, analytic pipeline? Well, the straightforward way would be to write the sequential code of this uh, analytic pipeline. So we define the different analytics methods. For example, we have a, a, a method for getting the frames from the camera. We have the detection method that processes these frames and detect, returns the detected objects and their bounding boxes. Then for each detected object, we perform tracking and eventually we apply the semantics and we detect some uh, events of interest. Now, what do we do with the help of uh, the open source software uh, called COMS is that we transform the sequential code in a code that can be distributed and parallelized across the compute continuum. And the key advantage of this approach is that this parallelization and distribution comes in a way transparent to the end user. So it's relatively easy for the developer to transform this sequential piece of code to a distributable source. So what do we do? is that COMS provides a programming model that enables the annotation of the different tasks. So we just put, before its, um, task defini uh, its um, method definition, we put a specific annotator and we, mask, we mark the different dependencies among uh, the tasks. So by the term dependencies, I mean that, for example, uh, to track an object, we need the history of the tracked positions in the previous frames. So this is a dependency, and that the output of one tracker has to be the input of the next one. So by just doing this specific annotation, uh, COMS will take care and transform this code into a task dependency graph. So it's a visual representation of the different tasks and their interdependencies. And then uh, it will be responsible for distributing the tasks in the available resources. So, seeing here a more complete example, this will be the, the pipeline of the analytics for, for the uh, analysis, for the processing of a single video frame. So here we have detection, tracking, the duplication, aggregation of data, and then hazard detection. If we go to the next frame of the same video, we do the same, but there is a dependency, for example, between the tracked objects of the first frame and the next one. But we can see here that there are some tasks, for example, the data aggregation and the event detection that are not dependent between them. And this task can be parallelized. And what is the worst thing that can happen? Well, we can process the second frame completely before finalizing the processing of the first one. But this is not a problem because for the real-time analysis, we, we would just get a result, or an alert of a more recent event. And for the offline analysis, we don't care about the order of of this information. And then if we add more cameras, we, we make a more complicated graph. And imagine that this is only for two, f for two frames and two cameras. So in a real situation, we will have a continuous video stream. The resulting graph would be much more complex. So let's see how this uh, deployment is, um, uh, is taken care of by COMS. So COMS has a, a master and worker uh, architecture. So we deploy the master and we provide uh, a first configuration of the available computing and communication units. So for example, here we say uh, to COMS that we have three available computing resources uh, that have these IPs or that uh, uh, can be containerized or whatever. And then by, through an integration with a, 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 the Nuvla API, this deployment of the workers is done automatically. So Nuvla is responsible of launching the necessary containers to the available resources in an automatic way. And once this is taken care of, COMS is responsible in the runtime to distribute the tasks and to handle all this execution. So this is the main functionality of uh, the COMS scheduler and how the deployment is taken care of. So to close this, uh, this presentation, we have seen that we introduced a software architecture 
uh, capable of handling the development, deployment, and effective ex execution of these complex analytics across the compute continuum. And we saw how uh, we take care of the deployment and scheduling, and how we leverage the COMS programming model to facilitate the, the development and distribution of such tasks in a way that is transparent to the end user and agnostic to the infrastructure. And we saw how the deployment is uh, done in a flexible way through the integration with the Nuvla API. Now, in the next three presentation sessions, we will go into detail for the other three uh, software components of the software architecture. So first, we will see how data management is handled across the DDAP. We will see uh, more detail about the capabilities of the different edge computing platforms. And finally, we will see how the monitoring of the non-functional properties is implementing and what is the interplay between the outcome of the monitoring and the scheduler. So that's all for my part. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Ellie. We're perfectly on time. It's amazing. So I, I, I suggest we go for our, our scheduled break, and then we'll, uh, we'll take um, more questions with the next, uh, the next session, if, if it's OK. So 10 minutes, um, half past, no? I, I, I have waving hands in the back. 10 minutes. 20 minutes, sorry. 20 minutes. Thank you, audience, for keeping me honest. So 20 minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll see, see you back uh, in 20 minutes. Thank you. All right, so welcome back from, from the break. Just as a reminder, we're here for the, uh, the final event of the Elastic Project. My name is Marc-Elian Bégin. I'm a CEO and co-founder at Six Squared, and I'm your moderator this morning. It's a great pleasure. So this morning, we, we heard about um, you know, the use cases and the, and the, the high-level architecture. So in this uh, second part, we'll, we'll deep dive into uh, some of those details. So the first session is uh, with Anna Quereld and, and uh, Cesar Marin. Um, so we'll start with focusing on the data, if, uh, if I understand well. So take it away. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so good morning. I'm Ana Queral from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and I have here with me Cesar. We are going to, to explain uh, how data is managed in the elastic infrastructure in order to support all the use cases and all the functionalities that we have seen. Uh, in, the, in the previous session this morning, both for, for real-time uh, uh, analytics and also for uh, uh, offline analytics that take into account the, all the history of events and data produced over time. The, the part of the Elastic Software Architecture that is in charge of these functionalities is the distributed data analytics platform, including different technologies that we will see but they, they are DataClay, Druid, uh, Kafka, and also Predator. And this, this part of the Elastic Infrastructure is in charge of managing data in the sense of uh, bringing the data uh, where it's needed and when it is needed in order to support the analytics and avoiding as much as possible data transfers. So we will start with an overview of, of all the data we have, the different data sources, how they are integrated, providing uh, a uniform view that is able to be uh, processed by the, by the analytics components. Then we are going to, to see the, the different technologies that, 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 that we have integrated, each one with a different role, in order to provide all these functionalities that are needed by the, by the use cases. And finally, we will close the, the, the circle from the data to the, to the knowledge that is generated for the users. Here we, we have, we have uh, one of the video frames that we have seen before. Uh, 
here we can see how the, 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 the data in the videos is translated into the concepts that we internally manage in order to support the, the analytics. We have, uh, in blue, we have objects that are cars. We have other kinds of objects that are pedestrians. And also we have information about the traffic lights. The one on the top is at this moment green for the cars. There is another traffic light that is in red. And all this conforms an event, an event snapshot, which is a, a set of events that are happening within a period of time and that are uh, analyzed in order to provide value, valuable results. For example, the generation of alerts. In this case, the, the pedestrian object is highlighted in, in red because it is a, a, a potentially dangerous situ situation has been identified because is crossing the road while the traffic light is, is green for the cars. More precisely, this is the, the integrated data model that we manage. This is how we encode all this data in order to, to provide an integrated view that can be processed by the analytics. We have objects with their uh, characteristics. They have a type. They, there can be cars. They can, can be trams, pedestrians, bikes, whatever. Each object has associated a set of events which define their trajectory, which is what is used to calculate the, the outputs of the analytics. And all the objects are represented in the same way, regardless the, the data source that they, that they come from. Here we have uh, objects coming from the cameras, as we have seen in the Florence use case. Also objects coming from the, from the sensors in the, and the cameras in the trams and other objects coming from the, from the NGAP use case, which is, determines the position of the tram. All of them are represented uh, in the same way so that they can be analyzed uniformly. And in particular, the NGAP data is uh, represented following the, the, FIWARE, uh, the FIWARE format, which is a European standard that, uh, that allows interoperability with different systems. This means that if uh, eventually some other system generating data in this format can be also integrated within Elastic, and Elastic will understand the meaning of its data and will be able to process it without any, any changes. Then this information is combined with, uh, <coughs> with the data com that comes from the, from the traffic lights. And together with this, the alerts are, are generated. Each alert has a uh, a, a, a given criticality level. There are, there are critical alerts or, or less critical. And these alerts are, uh, tra uh, are transmitted to the, to the vehicles also following the FIWARE standard, which means again that any other uh, system able to process this kind of information or any other system following the same standard will be able to consume these alerts that are generated by, by Elastic. So, how, how does it work? So here we are going to explain the, all the data infrastructure that supports uh, all these analytics in, in Elastic. At the bottom, we have the, the edge level, which are the trams that, that are, the, that are uh, uh, providing data to the edge level, which are the, the intersections, all the infrastructure that is distributed at each intersection. And here this data is combined with the, one, with the data that comes from the cameras and also from the traffic lights to perform the, the real-time analytics and produce the, the alerts uh, in real time. Then uh, at, a more, at a more global view, we have, we have the cloud, which uh, manages data uh, from all the, the intersections and also uh, data that is collected uh, over time. And in, and in this way, well, the idea for the idea of this of this infrastructure is to be able to uh, take advantage of all the all, all the different devices at the different levels across the the edge to cloud continuum, in order to avoid uh, unnecessary data transfers and thus produce uh, timely responses. And well, and we also have the the. The, the maintenance uh, use case that is also uh, uh, incorporating this data to, the, to, this, um, to, to this global data analytics platform. Wow. 
well, sorry. And the, the, technologies, that, the technologies that support this, this infrastructure are, uh, on the one hand, data clay in the, at, at, the intersection, at the intersection level, supporting the, the, um, the, the, the Florence use case, which has part of real time and also part of, of historical analytics. This, this, this use case is also supported by, by, by Druid, where data arise by means of, of Kafka. And finally, we have the, the predator uh, technology, and now we are going to explain all of them in, in a little bit more detail. So first, uh, we have data clay, which is a, a distributed object store that, that is developed uh, at BSC. Uh, and, and well, it, it, is, it, is, it was originally designed for high performance computing applications, but it, it, we have now also used them in, in, uh, in edge to cloud scenarios in, in different projects. And in particular, in this one, uh, the role of data clay is to integrate all this data from the different sources and support the distributed analytics at the level of, of, of intersection in order to produce uh, real time uh, events and in combination with the, with the comms uh, distributed processing runtime. Also, uh, another functionality of data clay within this project is to provide information to, to other components in Elastic. In particular, the alerts that are generated by, by the analytics are provided to the, to, the, to the vehicle communication infrastructure and also all the data gathered by data clay and, and the, the alerts generated too are uh, communicated to the, to the offline analytics, to the historical analytics in order to provide more insights that are, uh, that are given, taking into account all the history of events that happen uh, throughout the, the three intersections. Thank you. Um, well, as, as we have seen, um, data clay essentially manages the, the real-time requests. Yeah? Data arrives there, any real-time request from any analytics modules goes to there. But once that analysis has been, has been done, data then is, is, is collected at the cloud. It comes from the different tram, uh, tram stops and goes uh, to, the, to the cloud and arrives at a component called Kafka. Kafka is an open source uh, uh, software. It's not developed by any any partner in the project, uh, but we use it. We use it to to collect this information. And um, Kafka itself in, is an event event streaming uh, platform uh, for high performance uh, data integration, which is precisely what we're doing. Um, and uh, as soon as the data arrives arrives there at the cloud, it, it's made available. Uh, for the other other components we have sitting in the in the in the cloud, which is the the historical analytics. So the analytics continues, but now is no longer considered real time. Um, once the data uh, um, it's it's there and it's available for the the next component, which is Druid. Um, between these two components, uh, there are some. Um, um, other analytics components that, that take information from either Kafka or, or Druid itself, um, perform some aggregations or, or some filtering as well. Uh, and uh, that data is in the end deposited into, into Druid. Druid is a, is a database. Uh, again, this is one is not developed by, by any partner in the project. It's provided by the Apache Foundation, same as, same as Kafka. And we are using it to power our uh, visual, um, uh, the visual tools that you have seen in the previous presentations. Yeah, and that one is indeed developed by the project. Um, so Druid is a storage uh, built precisely for, for, uh, for analytics. Um, and uh, and uh, it's our main storage for, for, for the, uh, everything that has to do with, uh, well, most of the things that are um, historical analytics. And uh, because it's a time-based it's, it's time, uh, time um, storage, um, 
the analytics that uh, that uh, we do there it's all based on on when events occurred yeah this this allows us gives us the flexibility to say uh, to detect events that has happened in different locations but at the same time uh, moving on um do we have another component called predator this one is uh, implemented by information catalyst and uh, it's also sitting in the cloud and it's also for historical analytics and it takes data coming from the from the um, uh, maintenance vehicle, from the from the laser unit we have seen before, um, and uh, and it's used to um, analyze the shape, current shape of the of the rail track, and detect uh, uh, where where on the tracks, yeah, and uh, and over time this the, the, the shape of these tracks uh, starts to to. To change, yeah. This is normal usage of the of the of the of the, of the rail, and uh, the tool. Well, as you have seen before, the, um, it also indicates suggests to the users when they should do uh, uh, maintenance in certain locations. Um, uh, yes, and well, predator in, again. It's also mainly a visualization uh, tool. That not only sees uh, past and current status of the rail, but also future predictions. Um, okay, so in essence, that's the, the the data platform we have, supporting on one side the um, uh, real time uh, needs and data claims, dealing with all those requests in real time, um, and then at the same time that data travels to the cloud. Uh, for historical analytics, yeah. So we're covering the whole spectrum in the in the compute continuum. Um, just uh, final argument, just for, just for closing for closing the presentation. Um, yeah, Mark is looking at me. <laughs> um, um, in the past, uh, the metropolitan city of Florence has been uh, classified as, as a smart city, yeah. And we have seen in the first, in, the, in the first presentation that uh, well they incorporate uh, a, a technology uh, to to get data and, and to provide uh, uh, digital services to to the to the citizens um, well, we have also seen that uh, that uh, the complexity um, of the problem we are facing here different uh, uh, elements going on in, on on the streets on the trams with cars and different types of objects uh, which in the end are mapped into uh, into data model. We're essentially using a standard as as uh, as, uh, as it was before. Um, with that uh, that that format that that format is, is is used across the compute continuum in all the different uh, uh, computing units we have uh, distributed across the the, the um, tram stops uh, and some trams and also in the cloud which in the end help us cover both real-time and uh, historical uh, analytics needs. And with this, finally, this information is presented to the traffic engineers who then uh, can close the loop and see, okay, things we have done, this is the result, then we can make further improvements to the, uh, uh, in general to mobility in the city. And that's how we are helping the, the metropolitan city. That's it. Oops. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caesar. Thanks, Anna. Um, we're bang on time. Amazing. Um, so just to, to remind uh, our, our um, friends online, do please continue asking questions. We'll, we'll wrap those up at the end of the, of the session, if that's okay with you, um, so that we, uh, we can have a, a conversation at the end. So thank you very much for, for this presentation. Now we understand a bit more um, how, how does it work? <laughs> how does it work from a, a data perspective, right? So the next, next, uh, the next uh, session, uh, we'll talk about deployment. So I'd like to uh, invite uh, <laughs> myself and um, and Marco Gonzalez um, to, to to present. But we'll start with uh, with uh, with Marco. So please do do continue asking questions online, and we'll we'll pick them up at at, at the end. Here you go, Marco. Hello, good morning. My name is Marco González. Uh, I am from, from Ikerlan Research Center. 
And me and, and Mark will, will explain you a bit the work that we have done with the edge computing architecture and the platform for, for the Elastic project. Why we need a, a, an edge platform, an edge computing architecture? In order to be able to, to deploy all the, all the components, all the services, all the intelligence, all the use cases that my colleagues have, have explained before, we need some real devices running software that allows different, uh, different functionalities and features to be, to be running. As we can see in the, in the left part of the, of the slide, we are going to be focused in the bottom, the bottom box, which is the FOC platform which is the, 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 base, the base layer of services uh, that are, uh, have been, de been developed in, in the Elastic project that offers different kind of features that allows the, the, Elastic, uh, the, other, the other components of Elastic to have deployment, to have execution, to have a monitoring of the system or the different nodes and, and to be able to fulfill the different requirements of, of the Elastic that we are going to, to, to analyze now. First, we have to ask ourselves where, what, what does Elastic need from the FOC uh, platform, from the FOC architecture? First, it needs an application environment in order to, to, to be able to execute the different applications, all the different intelligence, uh, to be able to execute it directly on the, on the hardware, on the computing nodes, on the FOC nodes which are in, in the tram, the tram stop, uh, also in the cloud, in the depot, all that nodes uh, need to have an execution environment which allows us to, to execute containers, for example, Docker containers, binaries, directly binaries executed on the OS, and also all the communications needed to communicate all these applications and all these nodes which are distributed in, in, in all Florence, in, in these use cases, need to be communicated transparently for the user and for the applications. Also, Elastic, uh, the Elastic architecture needs remote deployment from a, from a central, from a central uh, node, from the cloud, needs to deploy different, uh, different applications to the different uh, FOG nodes. And we will explain that later, how, how we are doing it with Nubla. And last but not least, uh, we also need the monitoring of these nodes uh, to be able to know what is the situation, the current situation of the different nodes. The situation of the of what applications they are running, how are the communications, uh, uh, how much energy they are consuming, all that information needs to be provided to other components in the Elastic architecture. So, in this uh, in this uh, in this part in the in the FOC computing, uh, we have different monitoring in order to to provide the, that metrics to the to the platform. As you can see in this in this slide. This is the, the Elastic FOC architecture that we have developed in the, in the project. This is a generic uh, software architecture uh, that we have developed and is compatible for, for all Docker compatible OSs like Windows, Linux, uh, Mac. And here you can see, if, uh, I, will, I will describe it a bit from bottom to up, uh, from down to up, uh, the different components that the, the software architecture uh, FOC, FOC is, uh, has. First, we have the FOG manager, which is the, the software component uh, which controls the, the FOG node and also makes the, the monitoring of the different, uh, the, the situation of the node, the current node. Then we have the security component, which make, makes an assessment on real time about the security situation of the, of the node. We have the, the sensor manager, which controls the, the input output of sensors, for example, reading data from the, from the trams, reading data from different sensors. We have a, a component for that. Also the local storage, which is both data clay that uh, my colleagues explained before, and also local storage that can be uh, stored directly on the, on the node. And then on the uh, top part, we can see on the left, all the user applications, which are, which are the, uh, the applications that can be deployed remotely uh, to the node. For example, it can be an analytics, uh, an analytics application. And in the, in the right part, we can see all the communications components of the, of the node. Uh, with this, with these uh, components, we have an extraction uh, to be able to communicate uh, between services, between nodes, and also with the cloud. So we have an instruction to, to provide us, to provide an easy way for the developer to, 
to communicate with other other components, other nodes of the of the LASIK architecture. This is an, uh, a generic uh, software architecture, but then the implementation in, in, in the real nodes is done via two, two different implementations, which are both following the same uh, elastic uh, fog architecture, but one is the Nubla box from Six, and another one is the Ikerland Connect box from, from Ikerland. Uh, both uh, offer the same features, but are two different kind of implementations that we will explain a bit later. Here is just a, a recap. You can see all the developments that we have done, the different components. Uh, I will not explain one by one, but just as a, as a recap of all the work that we have done in the, in the FOG architecture for, for Elastic. And what we are going to do is we are going to focus in the three main features that Elastic needs from the FOG nodes, which is execution environment, deployment, and monitoring. And uh, we will explain a bit which, is, which are the capabilities of, the, of these Elastic FOG uh, nodes and, and what, uh, what is possible to do with, with Elastic. Please, Mark. Uh. Thank you. So here, here the idea is, is um, just to, to, to reinforce what you, what you just said, is um, in order for the stories to the, the use cases to be implemented, we need to make sure that we have the right software deployed at the right place at the right time with the right versions, right? It's a simple <laughs> problem to state. It's not that easy to actually execute, and that's why those, those, uh, those, those software infrastructures are in place. So the first one is Nuvla.io, which is an edge management platform. I'll show you a few screenshots uh, a little later if you, if you want to if you wanna, um, see this in, in, uh, in action. Um, but the... The foundation of, of at least the, the way we do this is, is, is to deploy containerized applications, and that containerization provides us with an abstraction that is convenient to, to deploy to, to many places across the continuum. And second is to base uh, communication based on MQTT, which is another key component that facilitates data transfer. In a, that's what we were discussing a, a, a bit a bit earlier. So those those foundations are helpful to to be able to play across the continuum. The next one is um, the fact that those uh, this container architecture allows us to create applications that are composed of microservices. That's another good architectural guideline if you want when creating applications because we can create modular uh, modular system and using the container ecosystem also allows us to do clustering. Right, so that we can actually cluster. We've done that for a long time in the cloud. Now we're able to actually move this to the edge where we can actually have edge devices that collaborate with each other using clustering strategies. Um, and ultimately at the end, what we want is to be able to provide the intelligence at the very top with insightful measurements that we can actually gather from across the continuum. And that's another key element to when we deploy applications, deploy algorithms, and so on, we also deploy a, a, a micro environment, if you want, that will be responsible for collecting metrics to monitor basically what's what's happening at the different levels and aggregate all this information so we can actually, you know, better optimize uh, go, going um, going forward. Okay, thank you. Then for the monitoring capabilities of the nodes. In order to provide Elastic with the metrics of the different, uh, the different uh, uh, metrics that we want to collect from the, from the system, we have four different agents of monitor for monitoring in the nodes. One is for communication, another is for time, other is for energy, and the last one is for security. From the communications part, because normally the nodes have different communication interfaces. For example, the nodes we are using in, in Elastic have Wi-Fi, Ethernet, and also LTE connection, 4G connection. So in order to have a, 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 good, a, a good view of the current situation of the node, we have to, to make, uh, uh, we have to calculate the, um, the, the latencies between the different nodes in order to have the current status of the system, of the communication system, in order to select which, kind, which communications we want to use. For example, 
Uh, if right now we have uh, problems with the coverage of uh, 4G, we can switch to, uh, to Wi-Fi in order to have better uh, quality of service. So if we do, if we do a real-time analysis of this um, communication status via the throughput normally and the latencies, uh, then we can select which nodes should uh, execute, for example, real-time applications and which not. From the time and energy part, uh, we, can, we can monitor uh, both the power consumption of the, of the nodes in order to, uh, if we want to optimize the consumption and reduce uh, the, the consumption of, the, of power of the different nodes, we have the current uh, power consumption and also the CPU load. With this CPU load, we can as assign new resources, new applications to the, to the computing nodes that are uh, with a less load. And last, in the security part, we have an agent-based security monitoring, which is doing in, in, in real time, is analyzing, analyzing uh, the different binaries, the different applications that are installed in the, in the OS. In the OS, this agent is, uh, is checking if, uh, if the binaries have some vulnerabilities, if the packages are not up to date. Also, the, the agent can detect if someone is trying to get inside our, our node via SSH or via another, another ways. Also, uh, for critical files of the, of the system, uh, the agent does automatically a fingerprinting of the files to check if someone that we don't want is changing the files. And with all this monitoring, we can check if the system is secure or not and inform the, the last architecture uh, with, the, with, the, with the real time status of the security situation of this, of, of all the nodes of, of our architecture. On the third feature that, that the FOG computing architecture need to, needs to provide to Elastic, we have the execution part. In the execution part, we need that in execution environment uh, for all the applications, uh, Elastic applications, uh, analytics applications that are going to be deployed and executed on the, on the nodes. We need this environment that provides us with a, with a base uh, services of, for example, communication. What kind of communications? When we have different uh, applications running in the node, they need to communicate between each other. For that, we have a local router that allows us very easy for the, for the developer to communicate between different applications which are, which are running in the same node. Also, in order to communicate with local sensors, for example, with the tram, some sensor that is in the tram, we have that same data router that allows us to communicate with local sensors. And the same for the cloud. If we want to go communicate with the cloud or with other nodes, uh, we have two clients uh, in order to, to send data. Real-time data, we use MQTT, and bull data, we are using FTP. In order to send th this data that we, are, uh, that we are analyzing or storing in, in the node, send it to another node or send it to the cloud. Uh, for this, we are using the FireWire model that uh, our colleagues explained in the, in the previous presentation. And also, we have an integration uh, with the V2X uh, infrastructure that is located in the, in the different Florence uh, transforms and infrastructure. Next, I will explain you, as I said before, this uh, Elastic Software architecture is a generic uh, a generic architecture, but then the implementation is done in two different products. We, one of them is uh, the Catalan Connect Box, another one is the, the six uh, Nubla Box and Nubla.io that uh, my colleague is going to, to explain. First, the Catalan Connect Box is an industry oriented uh, FOC platform that we develop at, uh, at Ikerland and is suited uh, for our clients in order to speed up the development of, of FOC, uh, FOC applications, FOC environments. It's microservices based, so it's compatible uh, with both Linux and, and Windows. And we decided to have uh, an approach based only in MQTTS, which can be connected to a private cloud or also to AWS in order to control all the nodes via this, uh, this, MQTT, uh, this MQTT interface in order to reduce the exposure of the, of the node to, to other, other protocols or to, have to, to open other ports, etc. With this uh, communication with the cloud, we are able to deploy 
both uh, applications via microservices and also uh, AI models. We are able to, to update in real time AI models which are retrained uh, continuously on the cloud. And then to have uh, multiple uh, services like local persistent, data buffering, and also industrial protocol connectors like OPC UA, etc. For the sixth uh, part, Mark will explain you. All right, thanks, Marco. So, so that, that second implementation of the reference architecture of, of, of Elastic, um, we have um, um, Nuvla.io and uh, Nuvla Box that are working together. So here's a little, like, really high-level view over the problem I was describing before, right, is to how do you make sure that the right software is deployed at the right place at the right time with the right version and, and, and updated over time. So I swear, you know, in, in, in our case, we don't have that many um, edge devices on board, but that's just an, an illustration of it. But it's to show that that kind of technology allows you to have an overall view so that from a single deployment platform, you can actually, you know, position and, you know, place uh, the, 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 the right uh, apps or the right algorithms at the right place, whether it's at the edge, in the cloud, or in between. So that these are, you know, the two, the two pieces of, of software working together. Nuvla Box is open source, um, and, and the idea is that it, it, you install it and it turns any Linux-based system um, into a, a connected edge device, so that, that it becomes remotely controlled from Nuvla.io, and Nuvla.io is the management platform that, that gives you this, this overview o o over, over, the, uh, over the, the, the system. In order to actually deliver the value that, that we, uh, I'm, I'm describing, this is what we need you know, from an architecture standpoint. Um, I'd rather not go through the details of, of all those components, um, but show you something a bit more, a bit more visual, which is a, a bit more, I think, interesting. Um, but this is the type of, of uh, if you open the lid on, on the service, these are the components that are required to, uh, to deploy, and that, that's what makes it compliant with the Elastic uh, architecture. Now, that was for Nuvla.io, right, the management platform. If you dive into the Nuvla Box software stack, that's what you, uh, you have here. And, you know, the common theme that comes back, you know, is this, uh, I've enlarged here because it wasn't visible on the original Im image, is the, the data gateway. So that's the MQTT bus that we have uh, inside of, the, of every edge device that provides a mean of communication between the different applications on board but also the way it's going to communicate with you know, upstream information if it talks directly uh, through that, uh, that protocol. And that architecture was really enhanced and, and hardened through the, um, the, the, through the project. So what does it look like if we, if we just uh, have a few, few look on, on the, uh, the Nuvla.io uh, user interface? That's the dashboard for I don't have a laser, but you see I'm, I'm switched to a group called Elastic Flow. Okay, so that's the project that actually oversees the, the, the group that sees all the resources that are relevant for, for this project out there. So we have 10 edge devices, and actually there's 12 applications. When this one was taken, there was nine started. One was in the process of being started, and two were stopped. Okay, so it gives you a, like a hover view over what application is, is, is deployed where. So if we dive in, to the edge devices, then we have the ability to geolocate. Now, <laughs> all of them are in Florence, but you can imagine when you have a, a, a more geographically distributed uh, application, then it's really helpful to figure out where, where is what in terms of monitoring, right, and health of the application that are deployed. If you zoom in, um, then you can also have the individual health and, and details of, of each card represents an, an edge device, and that gives you this you know, visual feedback over what's going on. Now, I'm showing you this for you to understand the, the integration in the operational model of Elastic is done through the API, right? Behind this user interface, there's an API. That's a single page app. But behind there's this, this API that is used by comms, for example, to create you know, the, the initial deployment and, and manage all of that.
we were talking about monitoring, right? Telemetry gets, gets reported, and this is a visual representation of some of that telemetry. So it gives you the details of, of what's, what's happening from, from those different um, uh, individual edge devices. And, and that's one of the part of the information that is used to, um, to do the, the work of assessing whether a, an edge device is, in, is healthy and if, if it's able to actually run the applications that it's intended to. If you switch on the application view, then we have a bunch of applications that can be deployed easily through the user interface or through an API call, and that will guarantee, well, guarantee that will do everything it can to actually deliver that application at the right place in our, in our H2 Cloud continuum. I, I couldn't resist put the cat here. I think it's cool. But it's, a, it's an object detection application. That we use a lot in demonstrations. But basically, there's a lot of data clay based application because these are the, some of the nodes you know, in terms of application that, that being deployed um, at the edge. And this is a view over the running application. You know, so I mentioned 12 applications earlier. This, this is a view over those applications running out there, and they're all attached to a, a specific um, edge device so we understand where, where all, all of those applications are running. I think that's, in, that's, that's it for us. <laughs> well done, Marco. I'll jump to my uh, next um, different, different hat. Um, again, no, th thank you. Thank you, Marco. So before the, the Q&A session, uh, we have one last uh, presentation. So Luis Miguel Pino and Eli, I think, here we Required uh, again <laughs> uh, on the stage um, to talk about uh, elasticity in the edge cloud compute continuum. Take it away. Thank you. Okay. So you sit down, uh, like you. Okay. So uh, um, so the the goal of this uh, of this presentation is to uh, uh, showcase how uh, elasticity comes together in the in the architecture. Uh, in the project, if this works. Oh, okay. So, recapping a little bit, so we have been hearing a lot about the importance of extreme scale analytics uh, and the need to, uh, to fulfill uh, the requirements which are uh, posed by those applications. Um, a lot about them is on uh, data in motion analysis and how we can process these data streams uh, in the fly, in the project. And, uh, before going that, I think it's important that we look a little bit about the requirements, the non-functional requirements that we also need to address in the project. So one of the goals of the project was to be able to provide the amount of resources needed to the applications, so no over-provisioning or under-provisioning, but fulfilling some uh, requirements related to uh, time, energy, communication, quality, and security. So starting with those, uh, the idea is that for these type of applications, so not restricting to the use case of the projects, but to smart applications in, uh, in general, we need to guarantee that uh, some requirements like uh, response times or predictability in the time domain, energy efficiency, because, for instance, for mobile devices, this could be a huge requirement, but also communication quality between the nodes in the system, and finally, security, that these properties are maintained by uh, the Elastic system, even when changing the configuration, even when adapting to change of loads or uh, situations. So in this, in this process, one of the challenges is the fact that uh, there's a lot of interdependency between those requirements. So for instance, if you move the processing to the cloud to get a, a higher processing capabilities, then you are challenging your uh, communication uh, quality of service. Even time and energy, so if you speed up your processing, if you give more computing power to your processing to achieve uh, a faster response time, then you will have uh, a higher energy consumption on your mobile devices. So there's an interplay in those, uh, in those properties that needs also to be, uh, to be addressed. So before going into how we address them, let's discuss how, on how elastic we looked at those uh, non-functional requirements. So we started by analyzing the requirements from the, the use cases and uh, similar domains 
from those four dimensions. So we ended up having a set of uh, 67 requirements that we had uh, to tick. I will not go through any of them. Uh, but just to, to give a, a, small, a small summary, so for time, the main uh, factor was uh, response time, uh, processing, uh, uh, the, um, the processing time, the fastest response time, but with predictability. For energy, in the elastic use cases, the requirements were not so demanding, uh, although in the smart domain for uh, um, mobile edge devices, we actually need to allot the energy efficiency at the nodes. In terms of communication quality, obviously the QoS of the communications were a very, very important factor, like Marco already uh, presented. And finally, in terms of security, uh, things like uh, authentication, encryption, but also privacy was one of the uh, requirements that was raised by this, this analysis. From that analysis, we ended up uh, as determining that Elastic would need to provide so mechanisms which allowed us to specify the level of non-functional properties that we need to, to meet, mechanisms in order to analyze those and determine configuration uh, of the system, and then uh, uh, the approaches to monitor the online execution of the applications and reconfigure if needed to fulfill the, the requirements. This led us to the development of what we called the NFR tool, which is the, a component of the Elastic Architecture that monitors those requirements and uh, provides the adaptation requirement in terms of uh, system configuration. So going back to a picture that we have already seen uh, that Ellie presented uh, uh, in the previous session. So this is the, the software architecture and the flow of, uh, of Elastic. So we are going to present the NFR tool, which is the, the box on the left, and the flow, the final part, the loop, the execution, uh, the execution monitoring and reconfiguration loop on the online execution of the, of the project. So going to the software architecture, as I, not, I noted, we developed the NFR tool, which has uh, several components, but from a high-level perspective, it provides basically the capability to monitor the properties on the different uh, dimensions, then uh, analyzing the um, eventual problems in those dimensions and determining what reconfiguration needs to be done in the system and specifying these to to the uh, orchestrator that Ellie already uh, presented, which then actually makes the rescheduling of the uh, of the applications in the in the system. In terms of the implementation, so basically what we have is a, a set of conceptual probes which are executing uh, or are available in the uh, edge platforms that was presented by Mark Alec and uh, Marco. And these are, the information on these probes is provided to resource specific monitors which will identify the, um, the issues, the violations as we call it, of uh, non-functional requirements in order to uh, provide the global resource management with the information needed for the reconfiguration. So all of this is um, transmitted through uh, MQTT. And basically, it's a, a published subscribe of the information, but the configuration, the changes on the configuration and the metrics, they are also stored in the distributed storage, uh, storage provided by uh, Data Clay. So Data Clay is also used not only for the applications, but also for the internal configuration of the Elastic system uh, itself. To see how it is actually uh, deployed, so these are some pictures from uh, one, of the, um, one of the tram stops in, uh, in Florence, so Batoni, and here we can see there are two um, elastic cabinets installed there, and we, in those cabinets we have actually three elastic nodes uh, executing these three elastic nodes so we have one NFR monitor, so the components that do the monitoring of the resource uh, of the resources in the system, uh, they are distributed in those nodes, and the global resource management is only per cluster, one per cluster, which is actually uh, managing the resources on uh, on that cluster. Now going into the 
details of these of these components. So for time and energy, as Marco presented, we have uh, CPU load and uh, power consumption in the nodes. This is what we are man monitoring. Then we have specific thresholds which are extracted from the actual execution of the applications uh, in the system. And these thresholds are used to compare the values that are being uh, uh, recorded. And if there is a, um, a problem, so a violation is sent to the resource manager. A similar approach approach is used for uh, the communication quality, where uh, the metrics is the, uh, the quality in the links of the, uh, of the node. And again, if thresholds, uh, in this case, thresholds of lower quality are uh, attained, then also violations are informed to the global resource manager. Such as in time and energy, communication quality, also these metrics are all stored in, uh, in data clay. Finally, for security, as also already presented, uh, there's a monitoring being performed, but in this case, there is a, a small uh, uh, difference in terms of the behavior, in terms of a violation, uh, because in this case, a security um, violation implies not a rescheduling, but actually that node can no longer be used for applications requiring uh, security. So to see how this is done then in the resource manager, I'm going back to uh, um, an example that Ellie already showed in a previous presentation. So basically the initial configuration, we have the, the different uh, master and workers in the, in the edge devices, and which have a specific number of uh, CPUs or computation units, for instance, uh, uh, attributed to each node and to each worker. And then what happens is if there is a, a violation, if some uh, worker is actually experiencing a higher workload in that in that node, uh, we may say, okay, th then we need to reduce the uh, CPU load in that uh, node, which basically means that uh, eventually this node, even the worker can be deactivated and um, some other worker needs to be deactivated and the computation load is shifted uh, elsewhere. So I will leave to, uh, to Ellie to uh, uh, present now on uh, how the orchestration uh, component actually puts all of this together and actually must the rescheduling. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, it was a great presentation. So I'll just have a few slides explaining an example of how this rescheduling takes place, taking into account the recommendation and metrics provided by the NFR tool. So go going back to our previous example, remember that we have uh, the different data analytic methods that were um, uh, described by a task graph. So in this example, we just have two consecutive frames being processed. So having the three available edge resources, the COM scheduler, based on some scheduling policy, will determine how to deploy and uh, schedule these different tasks. So let's consider this specific example. This would be the processing of uh, uh, two video frames uh, obtained by two cameras, and that the next video frames would also be distributed. So they, um, the scheduler uh, makes this task allocation uh, in periodic intervals. So these are the scheduling intervals. So in this example, we have a scheduling intervals of two time frames per camera. So for this scheduling interval, and if we consider this, if we consider this specific allocation, we can determine the overall workflow response time, what is the time uh, needed from the, the start of the execution of this workflow up to the final uh, completion of the last uh, analytics process. So the scheduler can implement different policies, all aiming to minimize this workflow response time. Now let's see how the NFR tool and the GRM come into play. So what happens is that in the three its devices, we have the NFR tool monitoring continuously checking the status of both the application execution and the performance of the uh, computing devices. So uh, based on the different thresholds that have been defined, the NFR tool is capable of detecting violation to these thresholds. And these violations are reported to a centralized entity that is the GRM. So then the GRM can take some actions and recommend some actions to the uh, comms orchestrator, which is the one that will uh, eventually implement these policies. So we have different levels of, um, 
of rescheduling. We have coarse grain rescheduling that is uh, either uh, turn off or turn on a worker on a given edge device. And we also have fine grain scheduling that, as Miguel said, uh, we can um, alter the number of allocated computing units for the execution of the analytics. So let's see a more complete example. Uh, going back to the same figure where the three deployed um, workers in the edge devices, let's consider an initial allocation of our workflow. So let's, cons let's assume that this is operating in a stable way and at some point we note a violation, maybe for uh, the time and energy component. Let's say that uh, due to extreme weather conditions, it's very hot and uh, the temperature of the CPU is rising a lot. So the GRM will issue, if I will issue a recommendation and uh, probably one possible action will be to, let's try to reduce the computing units used in this uh, compromised node to see if the performance improves. So comms will be alerted of this, of this reduction of available computing units and one potential action of the scheduler could be like, since I have less computing units in this edge node, I will allocate some task to a different node with more available computing power. So we can have like um, an example of uh, taking one task and uh, migrating to a different computing unit with better resources. Another example would be for the GRM to turn down uh, a specific worker. This can be, this can occur due to different reasons. Uh, the most straightforward reason would be for a security, security violation that compromises this node. So the action would be that for our secure application, this node must not be uh, used. A different uh, event that can result to the same uh, uh, outcome would be, for example, continuously having violations of the time and energy component that keep reducing the computing units until the node has to be turned off. Or not turned off, but not used. Uh, another possibility would be for the wireless link, for example, to be um, turned off or to be for some time disabled due to an obstacle standing uh, in between the line of sight. So this would, re uh, the, the, the result for comms would be the same. Uh, comms scheduler would know that uh, the, this specific computing unit, uh, computing resource could not be used. And the result would be to reschedule the tasks that are currently running in this compromised node to a different and more suitable resource. Now the third um, a part of this example would be uh, what happens if a compromised node is recovered? Let's say that the security issues are being fixed or the wireless leak is, again, uh, has a high quality. So what happens is that the NFR tool continuously mo monitors these nodes even if they are compromised or disabled, if possible. And if uh, the operation is recovered during a, a given period of time, COMS is alerted and is able to reutilize these resources. For example, some resources can, can go back and be rescheduled to this, uh, this worker that was previously disabled. So wrapping up this presentation, uh, I would like to say that um, another feature that we, we don't present in this example but is very important is to understand that uh, the integration between the GRM and the NFR tool with comms has two components. It, it has a distributed operation but also a decentralized component. So some metrics are, are obtained by the comp scheduler in a distributed way. For example, the, the computing units and the quality of the communication link can be consulted in a distributed way to do the scheduling. So the comps can know at any time that the specific links between two workers has a specific quality. But then there are some parts of this scheduling that need to be done in a, in a centralized way. For example, if we have two different applications sharing the same resources, then this view cannot be obtained by the comp scheduler. This view has to come from the, the GRM component, which can see the different priorities of the two different applications and can allocate resources based on the priority of the applications and the requirements. So I think that's all from my part. I don't know if you would no, like to. Okay, so thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. So with this concludes the um, the um, the second part of our of our of our event. 
Um, uh, so thanks very much for uh, you know, explaining what, what um, the last piece of the puzzle with respect to um, the non-functional requirement part. Um, we now um, have 35 minutes for Q&A. Right, so please, uh, I think, uh, so thanks for, for the presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> so, so we already have a number of, 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 of questions that um, have been asked online, and uh, there's a few hands in, in the room as well. So, Edu, you want to help with uh, you know, pulling out some of the questions from the, and then we'll probably ask for uh, <laughs> our experts back on stage to, uh, to answer some of those. Yes. So, in fact, I'm going to ask all the people that has is ended to come here because this is not uh, uh, this is not the work that has been done by each of us, but has been what by all of us. So could you come here, um, Igel, Eli, uh, Marco? Come here, Cesar, Anna. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, um, okay, so there have been a number of uh, questions. Uh, so some of those I think has been already addressed during a presentation, but, but I think it's, it's, it's uh, good that we can enforce uh, these questions again. So the first one uh, is, um, are you improve your algorithm on the severe weather conditions? And this is probably a question for Incenso. Yeah, we, I, I believe we answered already uh, um, after the presentation. Anyways, um, we are not uh, um, doing measurements uh, of weather conditions uh, on the field uh, at this stage. What we did was to um, create a simulation environment where we can inject noise uh, on different sensors, on um, radar, camera, and um, LiDAR, so that uh, uh, we can simulate the effect of weather conditions uh, on different sensors. And um, of course, this, it is expected that the weather conditions will affect uh, our system, and so we will have to, uh, we will have to take it uh, into consideration. What is uh, uh, a possibility for us is to leverage the fact that we are using different technologies, uh, so different kind of sensors, so uh, a weather condition that can badly affect one kind of sensor is not affecting the other one and vice versa. So in, 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 the, real, in the real world probably the real situation will be better than what we are simulating now. Okay, so uh, thank you. So the second one uh, that was already addressed by Eli uh, is how big is a latency on the data use in the real time for the, collect for the collision detection? So here I think we have two parts. Um, I would say uh, one is uh, the collision detector uh, that is implemented in a tram and there, uh, the latency, the communication latency is much smaller than, for example, the uh, use case we are implemented in a city, in which there, there is a distribution on, on the computation as Eli has already presented. Um, but we can roughly say that uh, we are in the case of the of the smart city use case we are in the range of uh, 10 frames per second which uh, taking into account the speed at which the event occurs uh, it's 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 far and for the and for the tram I guess the the speed is uh, the, the frames per second able to be says is much higher than this one Yes, for the camera, we we have optimized the we 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 
as well are using the YOLO uh, implementation, but we optimize a little bit uh, on ourselves and we uh, change the head of the model to make it more lightweight. So we are uh, running at about uh, 20, 30 frames uh, per second on the camera. Of course, this is not the frame rate of the system because we have much more information than this, um, because we have also radar frame, LiDAR frame, so all the sensors cooperate together. So our, um, um, our the, the number of messages we get from sensors per second uh, is distributed unevenly at about 70, uh, at se um, 70 times per second, so it's a, it's a lot of uh, messages. Okay, uh, so thank you. Um, then uh, there is also a question that it's how autonomous is the tram with the ADAS? Uh, well, the tram, just to make it clear, is not autonomous. Um, in fact, the, the name of what we claim is, is, is we are implemented towards autonomy, and so there is always a driver there. In fact, these are trams that are in regular operation. This means that are trams that are um, uh, bringing passengers, so, so there is no real autonomy. Um, then there is another question that says, how do you detect the trams? Traffic lights. Um, okay, so this is something that has been uh, addressed um, uh, by uh, by the pre by uh, both by, by uh, several presentations, but um, I can answer this. So the idea here is that we are reading from the from the state of the city directly for the system in the city that is controlling the state of as Emma Force. So this allows us to have access to the full um, networks of traffic lights of Orange. So it's not that we are reading one single traffic light, but we can read all uh, traffic lights uh, that for the use cases, of course, we are only interested on those in the three tram stops, but we can access uh, to any of those, which I think it's, it's, um, it's one of the, the, the positive things about the elastic technology is that, that we are able to, to gather all the information, uh, not from the cameras only, but from, uh, from, the, from the information that the city is collecting. Um, then there is also a question that is, uh, did you use your own cloud or use a third party cloud? So perhaps, Map, you can answer this question? Sure, thanks. <clears throat> so I think the architecture, we have to actually state that the, the reference architecture of Elastic is cloud neutral, right? That, that's, that's important. Otherwise, it would really constrain or restrict the, uh, its applicability. Now, in, in the reality of, of the implementation, we've used uh, a private cloud, the private cloud from, from Jest. That was mentioned several times when, when tram goes back and then data is offloaded or where that's where the, a lot of the, 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 the top level, you know, high level functions are, are, are running. But the architecture itself is, um, is, is, uh, is cloud neutral. And, you know, let me just emphasize when I say cloud, it really is public, private, hybrid, but it would, it would work in all of those cases. And from, from our perspective, from a Nuvla perspective, we, we do support all of all of the all of those uh, flavors of uh, of cloud. So when we say we've tackled the continuum, you know, from I think the things to the cloud, right beyond edge, and edge is in, you know, of course in the middle. Um, I think it's we we're, we're you know we can sustain that claim in a very generic way, which I think is quite powerful for with respect to our architecture. Thank you. Um, Okay, the next question is, is how will Elastic deal with cyber threats to a smart metropolitan city? So, Arco, you, you want to answer? Okay, about uh, cybersecurity threats, because we are doing a real-time assessment and, and analysis of the security of the different nodes, where we are uh, assuring is that all the, 
all the critical applications that need security uh, will be only deploy, deployed in nodes which are secure. So it's impossible for, for a, a critical application to be deployed in an insecure node. And we can define the different thresholds for the security in order to be more strict or less strict uh, for each one of the nodes. So, uh, for example, nodes which are uh, accessible from the outside, for example, which are in a tram stop that someone can access physically, we can put in a strict uh, threshold, a strict threshold in order to, to assure that the cybersecurity of the system is always at least controlled. Controlling uh, uh, the set of rules, it's impossible to have a complete assurance of the cybersecurity. But we have a very, a very high uh, percentage of uh, occurrence that if a node has some vulnerability or someone is trying to attack it, at least we can disable it as soon as possible, remove all the critical application and all the critical data, and just disable that, uh, that node for, for further exploration and, and analysis uh, afterwards. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. I just want to add because um, um, we in Thales care a lot about cybersecurity. Of course, we are one of the leaders uh, in in the sector, and um, so for the components that are on the on the tram itself, so uh, Adas and Gap, uh, they are on the process, uh, as Gianluca said, to become a Thales product. So. Because of these, uh, they have been designed with uh, um, cybersecurity by design and cybersecurity by default, complying to the um, ISA EEC um, 62443 standard at security level two. So this is very strict uh, requirement from Thales because this is our baseline cybersecurity uh, level. Just to com complement, I mean, there's the there's a threat, right, that tends to come from the outside. But <clears throat> when we're looking at a, uh, <coughs> sorry, a, um, a complex system like, like the one that has been demonstrated today, <clears throat> we also need to recognize the need for governance, right? Because if we don't have high control at the governance level, we might end up having internal threats, right? Something that slips in, right? And that's where something that we've been working on as part of all of the, uh, the beauties of these types of projects, we observe, right? And we, we think about what are the, the you know, the Gedenken experiment, well, what if this and that, and how do we handle this and, and so on. So one of them was really to focus on um, provenance. Okay, so we're, we're able now, in, in the Nubla Box software, to ensure that a device will only accept uh, Docker images that are coming from a known source, and even signed by a known authority, right? So the, the idea is really to, to put it in the context, uh, to put cybersecurity in, 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 the, in the governments, in the governance context, to ensure that whatever is running uh, across the continuum, right, is, is actually of, of good uh, signature, right? We, we, we understand what, what, what it is. So to basically push back potential inner threats that might, might come as well to simplify a little bit the, uh, the, the problem domain. So that, that's another way to maybe answer or tackle that, that, um, that, that question is, you know, make sure you, you defend your outer borders, but make sure there's no, you know, back doors that might, might, uh, might slip in. Good, thank you. Okay, so the last question from the online audience is, what is the maximum recovery time for a compromise node? Or what is the longest time a node could be disabled? So perhaps you want to answer me? Um, okay, so answering from the last, the, the maximum time a node could be disabled, well, if the node has some, uh, 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 some serious issue, it may be disabled uh, yes. permanently. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but the issue is that so all, all of this is, is uh, configurable and it is uh, uh, configured from uh, analysis of uh, of the system, so basically we have uh, um, we have several several um, times. Let's let's call it like that. So we are um, checking the metrics in the system. Uh, if 
I'm not uh, wrong, um, it's uh, per second uh, information that we are we are receiving. So we are uh, then um, saving these metrics in data clay, for instance, for uh, each five seconds. Uh, but the reaction to the events is uh, is uh, not periodic; it's reactive. Um, and then after we have a, a problem in one of the nodes, we have what we call it the instability time and this is the the time that uh, we consider okay the node is unstable unstable uh, let's do the change and wait until the end of this instability time to see if uh, uh, the uh, issues have been solved and we don't need to act further this instability time uh, is extracted from analyzing and executing the system and i think that currently is uh, set up in the uh, in the setup that's there it's uh, uh, 30 seconds and then we have what we call the stability time, which is the, the time that the node needs to be without any problem before we start putting this node back on, uh, uh, on the system or increasing computational units or actually activating the node if it was deactivated. It's also uh, depending from the analysis and I think that currently it's, it's set up as 120 seconds. So two minutes. But the idea is that the more data that we have from actual execution, these values are, will be uh, tuned in order to better reflect the actual execution of the, of the system. So I think it's, it's similar to other parts of the project that uh, as more data is available, we can actually reason more on uh, how to uh, uh, deploy and execute the system. And I think Ellie wanted to add something about the, then the scheduling itself. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to add that um, on the one hand, the, uh, if a node is disabled uh, due to force, if it turns off, the scheduler will notice immediately because the task will not be executed. But uh, if it is a scheduling decision uh, recommended by the GRM, it will be taken into account in the next scheduling cycle. So the delay will be different depending on the kind of source of this deactivation. If the, uh, if, uh, we, uh, the GRM just uh, recommended not using this worker for some time because of a time and energy violation, then the scheduler will simply not use this available worker, not schedule any tasks. And then when uh, the GRM recommends again to use it, uh, in the next scheduling cycle, immediately the task will be allocated and executed. However, if uh, the node is shut down and the, or the worker is permanently turned off, Recovering the system will take a bit of more time because we have to redeploy a worker, so this will be done uh, through Nuvla. So it will take some time, depending also on the wireless connectivity, to migrate, redeploy a new worker, and then schedule some uh, some tasks there. So, just I mean, uh, this is just to reflect a bit on you know past experience. We removing a resource is uh, is the, is the first thing to do when you know something goes wrong, it's probably the easiest thing to do as well. Bringing it back, that's more tricky, right? You need to align many things in order for, you know, suddenly you're moving the landing strip, right? So, whoa, no, <laughs> where am I landing my, my airplane now? And that requires, uh, you know, finer coordination between the different components. And um, I think we've done that, I think, and that's that something we should, you know, <laughs> you know, celebrate this because it's, it's not that trivial to bring back a, a resource, especially, you know, depending on its pedigree, what, what, where it was when it was pulled back. When you bring it back, then you need to re resync a number of services in order for that resource to be sound, right? To, to behave as it was before it was, it was, uh, it was, uh, it started to, to, to misbehave. So I think that's another great, you know, result of the, of the project is, is our ability to coordinate you know, a, a number of, of, of complex processes, not only to remove a threat, but then when the thing is sound, you know, you bring it back. Because remember, in, in, in production, these environments will run for years, right? So it's, it's easy to pull things out, and if it's difficult to put them back in, then at one point, you always, like, gravity is going to start pulling you down over time, which is a not, not a good thing, right? So just to say, well, well done, guys. <laughs> okay, so um, I would like to complement this because this, I think, it's an important message. Um, and this is one thing that Miguel has said already, but I want to reinforce this message. So we have provided the tools to do this. We are not tied to any scheduler. We are not tied to any specific number of seconds of recovery. This is fully configurable. 
So in that respect, I think that Elastic is also providing an excellent tool for the research community in order to, to, to keep working on how to distribute these complex systems in a fully heterogeneous environment. Okay, so with this we finish the online questions. Uh, so I don't know if there is a question from the audience. Okay, okay, you have one. You have one. You are you are not you you are not allowed. <laughs> you are not allowed. Okay. Now, if you, if you don't mind, I think I think this is a great opportunity to actually just reflect a little bit on challenges because it, look, it, it's great to 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 celebrate success, which I think we're entitled to do today. Uh, but you know, it's not straightforward, right? So maybe maybe a, a, a question I'm, I'm I'm interested to 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 um, at least have element of answers is. What are the challenges, right? What, what, what are the things that are, you know, difficult and, and, uh, that we, we started that journey, uh, you know, a, a while ago and then, and then, uh, that led to where we are now. Okay. I will, I will pick this challenge. <laughs> um, I mean, one of the things that, that, that I think, uh, is the next step, uh, is, we are always considering that we have full control, or up to a certain extent, we have certain control of the edge devices, because it's something that we own. Well, the city of Orense, the Città Metropolitana di Firenze owns. So we have access to it, we can control it, but it is not going to be like this in a future. And in fact, Ubla is providing means to have access to uh, remote devices in which you don't, you don't have such a control. But to me, the next step is um, a uh, multi-tenant edge system in which there is a device that is going to be uh, entered like, like we do today with the cloud. And then the number of challenges increases a lot because you are not going to execute one workflow, one tenant, but you're going to execute multiple tenants from different uh, agents, from different actors, from different companies. And there, uh, the challenges, the real-time ch challenges, uh, security challenges, privacy ch challenges are going to be huge. So I don't know if you want to say something about the challenge that our colleague has provided, of course. I just want to say that um, from the perspective of um, a use case partner of the project, um, yes, of course, there were challenges like uh, in, in, all the, in all the projects that you can take part of because something unexpected can happen. In this case, probably there, somebody was talking about pandemic. So <laughs> it was a little bit delayed, the infrastructure, we had some... Pro so it, we did very good uh, progress uh, even uh, during the pandemic. And uh, one particular point that is the opposite of the question, so it's a good point, of that, is that uh, for us, uh, really, many of the things were transparent. Uh, Nuvla, um, Data Clay, all the technology that we interacted with, with were, uh, I will, well suited for the, for the task. So for us, a good point is that, yeah, there were not so many challenges in interacting with this technology, even with the pandemic. <laughs> okay, good. So I think with, with this, we, we finish the questions and answers session. And so let's go to the final two slides. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to stay here, okay? Um, so I have only two remaining slides. Um, the first one is the home take message. Well, there are many, okay? Uh, so it is not that you have to take two. I mean, you, you can take as much as you would like. But at least there are two that I think are important to emphasize. I mean, all the things that we have been uh, uh, explaining to you can be summarized in perhaps these two 
Ulets. So the first is about the importance of having this software architecture. Okay, um, it is not that uh, um, let's say we have invented a completely new architecture, but it's like we have picked the right components and we have put all them together in an, a smart way. So then we have uh, tried to achieve one of the, the the three points that I think are important. That is to increase the productivity, the software development productivity of complex data analytics workflows being deployed in such a distributed environment. That, that, that this is a, a strong need that is needed in the, in the, in the, in the smart cities. Uh, the second point is that, is that because we are increasing this, this pro productivity, we can focus on enhancing the data analytics and not um, concentrate our efforts on how to run it, this on the, the infrastructure, because this is already provided. And not only this, we can take the, the benefit of the different characteristics. We can take benefit of the edge, we can take benefit of the cloud to run different analytics. And the last point is that this is, I think, one of the, the key innovations that in, in this project we have been working on is, is a fundamental uh, uh, property is the need of uh, fulfilling the non-functional requirements uh, like real time, energy, privacy, security, etc., etc. And we have been, and we have uh, used this technologies in order to 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 implement three uh, three three innovative challenging but still realistic use cases uh, that uh, that i think are taking all all the potentiality of the software architecture and my last slide is just to say th thank you uh to, to, to all, um, including myself. <laughs> so it's to, to, to us. Okay. Uh, because, uh, there have been, uh, uh, I mean, there have been difficult, uh, you know, to, to, to make the project advance during the pandemic time. I mean, uh, the, the first time we had access again to the infrastructure was three months ago. So, uh, and it's not the same at all. Uh, you know, working re remotely, I'm, I'm, I mean, the, 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 the Chitam, uh, uh, the, the flow. Oh, Orange has provided, uh, uh, all the support in order to, to facilitate this remote access, but it's not easy at all. Uh, and that, that's it. Only thank you guys. And I think with this, uh, finishes this session. Thank you very much. Thank you.